Hi, I'm Sam, and before we start, I want you to know that this video will contain discussions of depression, war, the COVID-19 pandemic, death, and general worldly despair. There will be brief mentions of suicide and references to animal testing, though nothing in depth and neither will be shown. Some of the writings and ideas of Nietzsche will be examined in this video, though nothing without critique. There will be spoilers for all of Final Fantasy XIV's main scenario quests. Endwalker is the focus, but assume everything else is fair game too. Some of the Endwalker post-patch content, such as Beast Tribes, will be mentioned, but will not be thoroughly discussed. Additionally, this video assumes at least a passing familiarity with the events and characters of Endwalker. 14 is an MMO with a continuous story that has been building upon itself for a decade. I won't be able to provide a plot synopsis for those who are unfamiliar with Endwalker's story. There's just too much to cover, and this video is already really big. You're welcome to watch this video regardless, but if you haven't played it, I really do recommend giving 14 a shot, and Walker is one of those stories that's worth experiencing. You, who are our future, tell me this, and tell me true. Has your journey been good? Has it been worthwhile? If I were to ask you, what's the meaning of life, what would you say? Could you justify your answer? Could you prove to me a fundamental truth? And, if faced with cruelty and bloodshed, or made keenly aware of the finite time you have on this world, could you tell me why you bothered to continue on each day? These are lofty questions, ones often brushed aside or obsessed over. They're not fit to be idly picked over in casual conversation, and they're certainly not the type of thing you expect from an MMORPG. Regardless, the quest to understand what people live for is the beating heart of Endwalker, Final Fantasy XIV's fifth expansion. And in many ways, it's what the game is about as a whole. From humble beginnings of slaying squirrels and doing chores for the locals, to the grand, fantastical highs of fighting dragons, traveling through space-time, and doing more chores for the locals, 14 has always placed an emphasis on looking at how people live. Each expansion introduces us to new cities and societies, be they the French Catholic Elizin of Ishgard, the secluded Viera of the Raktika, the Battle High Warriors of the Steppe, or any other of the myriad tribes that inhabit the star in its reflections. Learning who they are and what they do comes naturally, but the game takes its time finally asking why. And only then, once we've seen the end, can we come to understand how the question of why is responsible for everything we've come to know across five expansions, ten years, and hundreds of hours of playtime. Endwalker is a story thoroughly concerned with exploring questions about the fundamental condition of mankind, and in so doing it became an unexpectedly profound experience for many players, myself included. But breaking apart what that means and how Endwalker manages to resonate so deeply with so many people is not an easy task. You can't compress the answer into a soundbite or give a five-minute roundup of its narrative and themes. Endwalker is the climax and resolution to a decade-long story, yes, but that's not what gives it its depth. 14 has been pushing the envelope of what an MMO can be on an artistic level ever since Yoshi P dropped the meteor. And Endwalker is the culmination not just of 10 years of story, but 10 years of maturation among its writers, of trial and error and revision. It's nothing short of a triumph, a piece of intensely empathetic literature that managed to provoke overwhelming emotional responses from a truly massive number of people, many of whom report the experience as unique and having broken through walls they didn't know they had. Look no further than the comments section under uploads of Flow or Close in the Distance to find myriad players professing, I don't cry over video games, but this made me cry. The gravity of those simple sentiments can't be understated. The mark of truly powerful art is its ability to evoke emotion in the observer, and if Endwalker does one thing, it's make you feel things. The key to its success here isn't complicated. For all its fantastical elements, it is a fundamentally simple and extremely human story. Endwalker's core is constructed from some of the most basic and universal aspects of living as a person, and it spends the lion's share of its time recognizing and speaking to those parts of us. The big questions it concerns itself with are the big questions that humans have been asking since the dawn of our existence. The anxieties found in its conflicts are the same anxieties humans always have and always will struggle with, a familiar ache deep in our bones that we share with our ancient ancestors as much as our close-at-hand contemporaries. It's the one thing that makes man a unique animal, a driving force that's shaped humanity for thousands of years, a constant across the planet and throughout all of history. What's the meaning of life? Or, as Hermes posed to Medion, what do people live for? Why do we choose life every day knowing that we'll face hardship and despair? 
how can we experience joy when death is assured, and how do we cope with our existence in an uncaring universe bereft of true meaning? Where can we find comfort and solace and truth? Where lies happiness? Under all the layers of techno-fantastical paint, this is the beating heart of Endwalker, the star that the entire story orbits. What makes us human, and what it means to be human, are core pillars of the expansion. And to that end, everyone within the expansion must be a person. Complex, fully realized, fit with their own biases, flaws, and talents. And above all else, having or hoping for a sense of purpose. Antagonists within 14 have often been complex and far from truly evil. Nidhogg's rage was justified, and his actions were the result of an understandable desire for justice twisted into a hunger for revenge. Emmett Selk was a man trapped by a longing for the past, the result of 10,000 years of unending grief, with a goal so coherent and words so honeyed that to this day, more than a few players have been charmed into believing he was right. Heartbreak and humanity sit at the core of their villainy, and the legacy left by these figures is progressed further in Endwalker, where there is no true villain, just severely broken people and our own dark emotions. It's pretty incredible that Fandaniel, a madman who tells us quite clearly that he wants everyone to die horribly and for the world to end, is recontextualized as a person whose descent into this state can easily be understood. Even if we can't imagine sustaining or acting upon such emotions ourselves, well, Thancred and Astinian put it best. That said, if it's an existential debate in nature, then our arguments might not be as persuasive as you'd think. Fan Daniel wants to die and take everyone with him in an orgy of pain and suffering. An utterly vile and unforgivable idea. And yet, when spat upon by fate and wailing in the deepest pit of despair, who among us can say they have not entertained similar thoughts? There are nights black as pitch, bereft of hope, and no words of comfort can reach you. And it's all you can do to grit your teeth and choke back the bile. The more you see and suffer life's injustices, the more difficult they become to bear. Vengeance is nurtured in similar soil. Though your anger has a broader focus, the sentiment is much the same. A fervent desire to destroy others, to see them drown in torment, as you have. That about sums it up. The will to endure is not always as strong as the urge to burn it all down and salt the earth. Survival be damned. It's a struggle, often close and brutal. This, as with many of the game's more candid discussions of suffering, runs the risk of coming across as overly morose or, um, blackpilled? However, it keeps itself from ever coming across as preaching such things by the placement and framing of such conversations. There's a delicacy with which Endwalker handles its discussions of pain. Even here, the characters are honest about their own experiences grappling with despair in an attempt to understand Fandaniel, rather than taking the far easier route of isolating him as uniquely unstable and casting him as wholly different from themselves. There's always a sense of humanity to it, a compassionate recognition of the self and the other, even when agreement or compromise is wholly impossible. And that's absolutely vital to this sort of narrative. It's what prevents it from falling into melancholic sophistry. Antagonist or protagonist, dragon or space jelly, no one is immune to the whisperings of despair. There are no hearts made of stone here, and in illustrating this with every fiber of its being, Endwalker attempts to recognize the same in the player, and in so doing, ask them to show compassion to themselves and to others. It tells a story that very much touches at raw nerves, the vulnerabilities we all share. I would be lying if I denied that, at times, it is absolutely brutal in its pursuit of humanity. Even as I played the MSQ in time with friends, there were moments that left me so shaken that I was compelled to play through Endwalker twice more with other people, so that they wouldn't have to plunge into the abyss alone, so that I could warn them about particularly challenging and sometimes triggering content. In order to explore hope, the game asks, and shows, the endpoint of many characters who have lost all hope, who are unable to envision a future. In a stark, almost colorless world, we see the first instances of despair so consuming that some are convinced that death is the only feasible escape. It's hard to look at, sometimes so intense in its need to make you understand that it left my hands shaking with stress. It's still debatable whether or not some of its contents should have been presented without forewarning. 
The section of the game taking place in Ilsebard is particularly stark and severe in its willingness to portray the depths of suffering and the need for kindness and compassion for our fellow man. Its chain of quests takes on the monumental challenge of humanizing the evil empire that's plagued the hero and their companions throughout every expansion. Not by attempting to claim its conquest was logical or justified, but by showing the effect that a cruel imperial regime and its inevitable downfall can have on average individual people born under its rule and indoctrinated into its values. Perhaps the greatest of these individual tragedies is Lysinia and her sister. After a lifetime of exposure to propaganda that portrayed anyone unlike themselves as barbarous and duplicitous, they'd rather throw themselves to the wolves than believe that Alphino and Alice sincerely desire to aid them. They don't see these Ellas and children as people, only perceiving the savage shadows the Empire has cast on them. The result is senseless death, two girls lying cold on the ground, the snows of Ilsebard stained red beneath them. Throughout five expansions, Alphino and Alize have been through ordeals no kids should ever experience. Wars, massacres, apocalypses. The list goes on. And yet, every time I watch their eyes fall on the girls' corpses, it feels like a loss of innocence. Like they've been forced to recognize a new terror, one fully man-made. Fear and revulsion nurtured into visceral, bloody fruits. It's a horror, a disgrace, and a tragedy. But this too is the reality of humanity. Humanity twisted to the ends of the wicked. Our worst instincts leveraged to cruel ends until we're complacent in the agony of others and ourselves. Garlemald's bloody conquest has come to an end, and yet its legacy of hatred endures. Like heavy metals polluting the soil. It's impossible to say how long it will take to scrub away that harm, or how much collateral damage it'll cause in the years to come. And yet, Endwalker takes pains to show us that even here, in the wind and the cold, hope remains for those who are able to hold out their hand to it, to overcome the past and see humanity in the other. The Grand Company of Eorzea is made of myriad individuals who have suffered at the hands of the Empire, some who lived and languished directly under its rule, but who have committed themselves to separating Garlemald as an empire from the Garleon citizens left destitute and desperate in the wake of its collapse. A structure can't be saved, but sometimes a person can. Julis becomes our prime example, someone who has offered help multiple times. It's a bit of an understatement to say that he bites the hand offering to feed him, as Quintus's orders lead him to some terrible acts. But regardless, he's offered compassion. His desperation is so deep you can feel it in your bones, and even as he betrays you, it's almost impossible not to understand why and ultimately forgive him. The collapse of an empire, inevitable as it was, evil as it was, is still a tragedy. It's a tragedy for the normal people who were lied to and destroyed by a system and leaders they placed their faith in, who were left to die in the cold as Xenos and Fandaniel leveraged the husk of Garlemald for their own ends. The Garlean Empire has been a looming, abhorrent evil since the beginning. Hatred is justified, but its people are just that. People. Living, breathing beings capable of thoughts and love and sorrow. For the rest of the world, this is a triumph. But for them, it's still an end to everything they ever knew. Though, as much of an ending as it is, it's not total obliteration. There's still an after. This isn't an isolated event, either. Endwalker, in many ways, is a series of tragedies, of calamities and destruction. And yet, none of them are ends. Garlemald is left in flaming ruins. Zodiark is released and destroyed. Thavnir is overrun by blasphemies. Even the final days of the Unsunder world unfold before our eyes. But none of these are ends. Each time, we witness untold destruction and despair. But there's always an after, the calm in the wake of the storm. There's always people, picking themselves back up, mourning that which they've lost, but continuing to survive and finding a way to move forward. Ultimately, this is what Endwalker's story is about. A song of hope, a belief in tomorrow, no matter how bleak things get. Humanity is the heart of the expansion, not only in our boundless potential for compassion and kindness, but in the unyielding nature of the human spirit, in our noble, admirable, and even downright foolish ability to look beyond pain and choose to continue trying. It's in our ability to stare the end in the face and still imagine a world beyond, in our terrifying struggle for meaning and our ability to choose life for the simplest of reasons. We know our death is inevitable, but rather than fear our end, we can use it to see the beauty in the world around us, in the connections we share with others, in every little achievement, in the simple joys of good food and good company. After all, it's the little things that make life worth living, isn't it? So come with me, spend some time by my side as we walk the end, in all its beauty and terror, in all its philosophical ramblings and spiritual connections, in all its simple bliss, quiet solitude, and heroic highs. The culmination of ten years has brought us here, to the end. Somewhere within the story about life and love and despair, we might find our answer.
While Endwalker is the final chapter of the entire saga of Hydaelyn and Zodiark, it also includes the first. Shortly after the current day apocalypse kicks off, the narrative takes an astonishing turn when the Warrior of Light is thrown 12,000 years into the past to witness the impetus of not only the final days, but the story as a whole. In so doing, the entire narrative of Final Fantasy XIV thus far is recontextualized as being part of a stable time loop. It also reframes much of what we previously saw as divine or beyond our knowledge, as very intensely human. Fantastical as the Unsundered World is, it's also mundane in many ways. The Ancients can snap their fingers and create life, but they handle it via bureaucracy. The Convocation of Fourteen isn't an untouchable, unknowable echelon of spiritual leaders. They're just elected officials. And before Hydaelyn was a constructed goddess, she was Vana, just a normal person. And sure, we knew a lot of this already, but to see it in motion, to see Emmett Selk as a grumpy civil servant hanging out with his boyfriend, so far from the megalomaniac that stole the show in Shadowbringers, it grounds everything immensely. None of the forces that have been manipulating Eorzea since ARR are divine. They're just older, more powerful people. It's like being in third grade and seeing your teacher in sweatpants at the grocery store. Most striking, though, is the former Fan Daniel. We find out that before he was the prancing, malicious, suicidal jester of present day, before he was even Fan Daniel at all, he was Hermes, the meek and sullen chief overseer of Elpis. Elpis itself is built to seem like a sort of paradise, a floating garden of Eden that the game itself labels a miracle works. It's beautiful, it's magical, it's a wonderland that shows the splendor of the unsundered world that Emmett Selk promised us. And yet Hermes, the man in charge of it, is utterly miserable. Half of the boss fights in this expansion are Hermes in some shape or form. Whether he's pestering you as a lingering shade, hijacking Zodiac, or transforming to protect his bird daughter. Each iteration had its own unique stated goal, but at the end of the day, every action is driven by the same core of despair, a core that we come to understand during our time in Elpis. Whether in desperation or resignation, he is the culmination of unbearable pain every time we face him. This beautiful utopia built by demigods is, in truth, the horrific product of unfettered hubris and delusions of divine grandeur. The lush flora and fascinating fauna mask a terror that sits in plain sight, making it easy to miss the forest for the trees. Elpis seems whimsical, but if you look closely, the truth is revealed. The Asians are quite literally playing god, and they've made this a normal aspect of their society. Elpis is a place where living beings are treated as art projects, with failed experiments disposed of as easily as a flawed sketch. There's a reckless disregard for life, so much so that no one bats an eye at the daily euthanization of creatures that just aren't up to snuff. They came from Aether, and they'll go back to it. What's the issue? It's only Hermes, with his soft heart and deep wellspring of empathy, that sees the issue here. The Ancients have no fear of death. They live and die on their own terms. It's always their own choice. And as such, they fail to sympathize with a creature forced to perish before its time. They've come to an almost infantile state of ignorant bliss on the matter, one that allows them to enact cruelty after cruelty without so much as flinching. They're so alienated from everything around them that they fail to see any flaws in their actions, leaving Hermes as the sole witness to the slaughter. Not only is he forced to watch and participate, but he's isolated in the grief and horror it causes him. Hermes' plight is ultimately something that can be understood as a reflection of the real world, and our own relationship with nature. The best means of exploring the conflict shown here and the view that Hermes embodies is by discussing theory surrounding something called the Metabolic Rift. Put simply, the Metabolic Rift refers to the alienation from nature that humans have experienced as a result of advancements in technology and the restructuring of society that came from an increased focus on production and capitalism. Well, a discussion of economic systems isn't terribly helpful to our understanding of Hermes, this theory does have a much wider application within sociology and ecology. In fact, were the theory not named before the word ecology was coined, it likely would have been called the ecological rift. Fun fact. So how do we understand it? The separation of the human and the natural? Well, we can start by examining the basic notion that there even is any significant separation between the two. Sometimes we find ourselves caught in the trap of charting the man-made and the natural as two sides of a spectrum, as distinct categories that stand in stark opposition. Society's predominant view is that a human is not an animal, but a distinct entity that exists in a separate class from other living creatures. We are a pocket of existence all our own, and all other life on Earth falls into a separate and lesser category. We're the intelligent life, after after all, inheritors and arbiters of the earth. We are divine in our right to rule and subjugate the land as we see fit. 
Of course, this way of thinking is pure fallacy and does much harm and little good. There is no such thing as true separation from nature, only alienation. Every time you eat something, be it grain baked into bread, a salad made of leafy greens, or a sloppy rack of ribs, that's all animals and plants. The table you're sitting at is made from the wood of trees, and even the processed components of a building like steel and cement originate in rock and ore excavated from the earth. Nothing is pulled from the ether full sail. Rather, it is procured from natural elements before being processed into familiar forms that surround us in our day-to-day -day life. Everything, literally everything comes from nature. This is vital to understand here. So it begs the question, where does natural end? The answer becomes especially inscrutable when we ask what exactly humans are, if not natural. While philosophical arguments can be made, there's no concrete biological characteristic that separates humans from other creatures of the world. We're made of the same flesh and bone as rats and birds and lions. As with animals, our bodies require hydration and protein and vitamins. There's no true separation, only alienation. Regardless, society functions on the assumption that man is a unique organism, more worthy than its peers. Whether or not most people actively identify themselves as proponents of this school of thought, its prevalence is plain to see anywhere from entertainment to politics. It's an overarching sentiment that seamlessly and unconsciously guides thought. It's a fact that's taken for granted. To illustrate how casually this affects our thoughts and practices, allow me to provide an example. Funerary practices. While funerary rites and customs vary throughout the world, the most common practice in our neck of the woods is to preserve a body and bury it inside a casket, sometimes even including a cement box between the casket and the dirt. Entirely normal, right? But let me raise you a question. Isn't this a detriment? What's the actual point of preserving a body long term and keeping it away from the bugs and bacteria living within the soil? The first thought for many is that our loved ones need to be protected from these things. But we're not protecting them, really. They've already passed on. Having time to mourn and say goodbye is important, but after that, no one is using that body anymore, and by locking it up, we assure nothing else ever can. We all know what the natural life cycle is and how it contributes to the food chain. A wolf dies, and then its body is eaten by scavengers and decomposers like fungi and bugs. Eventually, through the combined efforts of microorganisms like bacteria, it breaks down and surrounding plants draw nutrients from it. These plants are, in turn, eaten by local deer, who will eventually be eaten by another wolf. I know it might turn people's stomachs, but I want you to really ask yourselves, why should humans be exempt from this process? After a lifetime of consuming other organisms, why shouldn't we give our vacant bodies to be consumed? The feeling of discomfort many get when posed this sort of question is at the core of what I mean when I talk about alienation from nature. The current structure of society keeps the vast majority of people away from the fundamental processes of life. I've heard stories of children being horrified when they learn that meat comes from a living creature. And yeah, I imagine it would be quite a shock, since a kid living in a town or a city is likely to have zero experience with livestock or food production. Meanwhile, every other creature on the planet knows that their nourishment comes from other life. Hunting is is an everyday occurrence for almost every other creature on the planet. Now, I'm really not saying that children should be going on school field trips to meatpacking plants, but I don't think it's totally beneficial to keep them ignorant of the basic facets of life and the central role that consumption plays in the life cycle that we're very much a part of. Most of us live secluded from it, and it slips our minds, so much so that nature becomes a thing separate and far away. But buildings, cities, and towns are not realms lacking or opposite of nature. Rather, they're structures erected in a larger natural environment. It's just one that's been changed to suit man's needs, in the same way that a fox digs a burrow. Animals change external nature by their activities just as man does, if not to the same extent. And these changes, made by them in their environment, as we have seen, in turn react upon and change their originators. For in nature, nothing takes place in isolation. Everything affects every other thing, and vice versa. And it is usually because this many-sided motion and interaction is forgotten that we are prevented from clearly seeing the simplest things. That simple thing being that there is no true separation from nature, only alienation. This alienation is how so many can mindlessly throw their trash out the window along highways, or turn a blind eye to the ongoing climate crises. The environment and its inner workings are nebulous concepts that we assume we have no bearing on, and therefore they aren't our problem until things begin to go horrifically wrong. I wonder how often I've heard the sentiment that all mosquitoes or hornets should drop dead. In retribution for the unforgivable crime of being a minor nuisance, 
many would gladly do away with an entire species. So many can't see value beyond their own distaste. While I would argue that all living creatures have inherent worth, if a more logical standpoint is required, well, mosquitoes are a quite important prey species that make up a staple in many organisms' diets. Get rid of mosquitoes and soon we'd lose more charismatic creatures, like frogs and bats and dragonflies. And as they died, creatures further up the trophic scale would suffer and perish as well. It's all connected. Nothing in nature takes place in isolation, and humans are not excluded from that rule. Even so, we still consider ourselves different, uniquely supreme. We've become so alienated that we refuse to see the inherent worth of other living things, or even count ourselves among them. It makes you wonder, could this get worse? What would that look like? Well, Hermes lives in a society that has been so horrifically alienated from nature that nature has been turned into complete commodity. Plants and animals are designed. The wilderness has been tamed and is constantly tweaked to suit the passing fancies and fads of society. Sharks are among the most popular sea creatures. Rare is the day when someone does not submit a new concept. At first, they were largely orthodox consideration given to such things as size and environmental impact, and then a whimsical someone thought to bestow it with flight, another superior intelligence. And then the floodgates burst, concepts with multiple heads or arms or legs or arms and legs, and so on and so forth. It was getting absurd. A part of me wanted to tell them to go away and find something else to create, but in the end I couldn't deny their passion. The ancients don't even consider themselves denizens of the planet, referring to themselves instead as stewards of the star, vocabulary that betrays the flawed view they have of their connection to other living things. The player is treated to a front row seat of how this alienation manifests during their time in Elpis, as they watch Hermes perform his role as its overseer and put down the flawed creations within. Given the might to bring life into creation, the ancients have devalued that life into little more than passing things, objects and toys to be tossed out should they not fit their vision. It's all just energy, so when they get the design wrong, reduce it back to a pure form and start over. But step back from that perspective, that ego that places you as a god among ants. Reach out with the compassion that Endwalker begs us to cultivate, and recognize that all these creatures are living, breathing, thinking beings. The sight you'd be met with is a horror, even more so for Hermes, who finds himself in the role of horror's facilitator. It's quite possible that he only accepted the role in the first place to try and lessen the cruelty he saw in Elpis. His position gave him the ability to create and wield something like Kairos, which, prior to the MSQ, was used expressly for the rather noble goal of giving flawed designs a second chance at survival. He spent much of his time and energy attempting to give the concepts in Elpis every chance at survival he could, delaying their expulsion from existence at every turn. His empathy was vast, and their pain was his own. Even so, there was only so much he could do when faced with the overwhelming sentiment of ancient society. Other denizens of Elpis find his frantic attempts at preserving concepts inscrutable and at times even ludicrous. One researcher laughs in his face as he attempts to find a means of saving the Ikeon, going as far as to call him melodramatic for implying that their dissolvement back into ether even counts as a real death. Within Elpis, he found no fellows who shared his worldview, and in that isolation, his despair flourished and festered. Though clearly mixed with a self-loathing that stemmed from the fear that he might be the aberrant one, the continual pain and defeat that stalked him fed a contempt that had taken root in his soul. Look at the way he mourns the Ikeon. Look how he projects his rage onto it and encourages it to take revenge on him and the onlookers. Though suppressed, that hatred would be the straw that eventually broke the camel's back. Though Medion was the mechanism through which the final days occurred, Hermes was the main catalyst. This isn't to discount the influence of countless dead and dying worlds. The despair that the Matea encountered on their journey cannot be understated, and took an unfathomable toll on what would become the driving force behind the Song of Oblivion. But that said, Medion was set up for defeat from the very beginning and at the very end. While it's clear that Hermes deeply loved his creation, treating her as a daughter rather than an animal or machine, he also managed to make every mistake he could with her creation and development. His own fragile mental state made him oblivious to what he was doing, even as it becomes painfully clear to the player throughout the Elpis section of the game. By the time he'd chosen to create Medion, Hermes had already lost faith in Aetherus and its people, turning instead to the stars, upon which he would hang his surviving hopes. Those hopes would be strung around Medion's neck, and when the stars came tumbling down, their weight would prove enough to snap it. 
By this point, Hermes already viewed Aetherus as a horror, and as any good father would, he wanted to protect his creation from it. So Medion was a private project. No others were consulted, allowed to give advice, or made privy of her details. Once made, this mindset was reflected in what could be called her upbringing. Medion kept close to Hermes' side, her interactions with Elpis's other inhabitants not restricted per se, but certainly not allowed to grow robust. His fellows were kept at a distance, shooed away when he invoked the customs for developing concepts, namely that it was impolite to trifle with personal projects in their early stages. Though, as we know, Medion was not in an experimental stage. Not only was she a fully realized concept, her sisters had already been sent off on their mission to other stars. Tragic Basically, in doing this, Hermes had deprived her of a vital tool she would need to succeed in such an undertaking. Emotional intelligence and maturity. Meteon, though I gave you wings to soar the heavens, I did not teach you how to walk the earth. So loath was I to bind another living being. In the course of your long journey, you will learn from those you meet, learn to walk and run and so much more. Midian is a child, not only in form, but also in mind. She functions with the same capacity as an eight or nine year old at most. Look at the way she trips over herself in excitement, how she can barely struggle out a complete sentence without using her telepathy. When Hermes said that he didn't teach her to walk the earth, he means that he didn't teach her the life skills that others attain as a natural result of growing up. She's been sheltered, in a word. As a result, she's on no level equipped to manage the emotions that myriad dead worlds thrust on her. In his desperate quest to to find meaning beyond the world that had chipped away at him, Hermes failed to consider that those distant stars might not be the beacons of hope and joy that he longed for. The reality of it is enough to break anyone, and that's not even mentioning how an Entelechi would react. Medion, by composition, is often unable to detangle the feelings of others from her own. She believes apples covered in syrup are her favorite food, despite being incapable of eating, because Hermes enjoys them, and in feeling his enjoyment, she mistakes it for her own. The Matea sisters, one by one, fell victim to the same quirk of their nature. Each time one came upon a dead or dying star, she was forced to absorb all the pain and despair within, taking it as her own and then projecting it to each of her sisters. The Matea want universal oblivion because that was the emotion they were exposed to, not because Medion as an individual chose that path. She was helpless, a child sent on a mission that was doomed from the start. The blame then lies in Hermes, her creator. But even so, I find myself unable to view him as an individual deserving of scorn. Yes, unequivocally, he is responsible for all the havoc wrought, and he is far from innocent. Yet time and again, I find myself wondering whether or not all of this was inevitable. So much of Hermes' suffering was a byproduct of the society he existed in, and the standards of that same society are what isolated him until his mental fortitude finally cracked. The culture of the ancients lauded homogeneity. They valued collectivism and consistency to such a degree that they all wore identical robes and masks so as not to have any one person stand out among a crowd. They considered debate and dialectics to be the standard and infallible system for resolving disagreements or problems. There was a very clearly prescribed standard for existence in ancient society, and those who came up short, well, they certainly aren't happy, are they? We know seven named and fleshed out ancients, and two of those seven are completely miserable. That's really not a good track record. As much as Hermes believes that he alone is the only person in the ancient world to feel despair, this is mere misconception brought about by the image of an idealized society that the ancient world clings to. Its insistence on its own status as a utopia only compounds the suffering of the people that slip through the cracks. The people who aren't content, who don't experience the same peace and happiness lauded by the rest of the world. Their refusal to ideate pain and suffering doesn't just stop at their creations, it extends to other people. For as much as Hermes faltered in his own right, he was deeply failed by the society around him. Where could he turn when the prevailing cultural attitudes scoff at the notion of despair? There was no support system, no help he could have sought out. His concerns are perpetually seen as melodrama, a strange and amusing character quirk that those around him laugh off. Hades was correct when he asserted that Hermes didn't belong in Elpis, that his role there was only amplifying his suffering. Yet, how could he have left his position as overseer when your title and duty are everything in ancient society? Sure, the seat of Fan Daniel was a feasible ticket to freedom, but as we all know too well, by the time that offer came, it was too late. It's a tragedy that a soft and empathetic heart was his downfall. The traits that should lead someone to kindness were bruised and bloodied until he had nothing left, until the world around him had so thoroughly broken him that the only place he could think of to find happiness was the distant stars. 
and thus he sends Medion on her doomed voyage. Suffering is inescapable, and the inevitable endpoint of existence is death. That's the only meaning that Medion could pull from her journey, a lack of one. It's not really revolutionary for me to say that Endwalker is a story deeply concerned with nihilism. But Endwalker isn't just about nihilism. It's a progression of the original philosophy that rejects nihilism's classical endpoint in favor of its own, one far more humanistic that emphasizes the need for compassion and connection. That endpoint, the answer that its narrative is so obsessed with, is an amalgam of a few different philosophical perspectives, but one that takes base nihilism as a bedrock that needs to be built upon. But before I can explain how Alize obliterating Xenos in the marketplace of ideas is a stand-in for calling Nietzsche a bitch, I need to go over a few basic points about the original theory, as the common pop culture conception of nihilism seems to stop at a depressing keen of life has no meaning. Nihilism, a school of philosophy created by Friedrich Nietzsche, does indeed posit that life has no meaning. But it absolutely must be noted that this statement is distinct from life is meaningless. By itself, nihilism isn't even a full life philosophy. Rather, it's a transitional state, a crisis of belief that one can enter, but ultimately leaves. In short, it's what happens when your preconceived notions about the fundamental truths of life and the universe are challenged and broken. The phrase, God is dead, oft a tagline for nihilism as a whole, doesn't describe some literal divine corpse or a war on religious values. Instead, it expresses that many aspects of religious belief can no longer be seen as believable given the ways our understanding of the world has advanced in the modern era. As science has progressed over time, humans have learned more and more about concrete reality and the inner workings of the universe. As a result, long standing assumptions of what the world is have been challenged time and again. For one example, take how the discovery that the Earth orbits the Sun and not vice versa challenged popular beliefs of the day, so much so that people were tried and executed by the church for it. When the heliocentric model was finally fully adopted, many experienced the terror of cosmic insignificance for the first time. If the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, then are humans really as special as we've been led to believe? This is the kind of crisis that leads one to nihilism, the sudden shaking of what we thought was true, a sense of cosmic uncertainty, or a challenge to what was once considered fundamental truth, especially when it comes in conflict with notions of the divine. To take an example from 14, look at how divided and unsteady Ishgardians are after the Dragon Song War's conclusion. For generations, Ishgard's people have been taught that dragons were the enemy, that they were terrible aggressors. They were inherently violent and cruel, having no reason to want the Holy See's demise beyond their existence as creatures of pure evil. The entire culture of Ishgard, from its knights to its high houses, was formed as a response to the threat they faced. The Hellonic religion was formed under the pretense of war, and the conception of the afterlife that followed relied on the perpetual threat of death in combat or in service of it. From the day they're born, Ishgardians are taught that there is a concrete and known design to the world and the cosmos, and that by living as they have, they have labored in service of a cosmic good, that their every action has meaning because they carry out the will of an omnipotent and infallible being. This offers an immortal comfort, even as they toil under endless war, even as they lose loved ones and starve and die, they do so under holy guidance. The Dragon Song War is justified not by mortal law, but by divine authority. Thus, they can do no wrong. Then, in the wake of Thordon's death, Aymeric becomes the de facto authority of the city-state and reveals the truth of Ishgard's history and their ancestors' treachery against Radatoskar. Worst of all, he calls for peace, for Ishgardians to lay down their arms and not only forgive the Dravanians, but admit guilt. He suffers severe backlash, up to and including attempts on his life. A non-negligible percentage of Guardians outright reject the peaceful understanding that man and dragon have come to. And how could they not? Generations lived and died by the sword, the whole of their lives given to repel the threat of dragons. The graves of their loved ones are still fresh, and those sworn to knighthood or living on the outer walls of the city have experienced the dragon's brutality and terror firsthand. Helone herself has guided them on their righteous crusade, has she not? for everything they've ever believed in to come crashing down at a moment's notice. Without being privy to the truths and trials experienced by the Warrior of Light and company, it's gonna be a bitter pill to swallow. Of course, people are going to form conspiracy theories that the Lord Commander is in league with the dragons, because the only other option is admitting that they've been wrong their entire life. 
As coveted as peace has been, this was never how it was supposed to go. The foundations of their lives and beliefs have not only been called into question, but wholly dashed against the rocks. Suddenly, sons and daughters have died for nothing. Loved ones, who were once hailed as heroes that nobly sacrificed themselves, are being recast as villains and pawns, perpetrators of terror. Worst of all, the glorious heaven of ice, a Valhalla for the noble and true that fell in battle, it's called into question. If their deeds were, in truth, wicked, what awaits them after death? Much like the revelation that the Earth orbited the Sun, the end of the Dragonsong War was a shattering of culture and faith. The outright destruction of what was supposed to be knowledge imparted by the heavens. And if the heavens are wrong, if the word of God was not absolute, a terrifying possibility breaks. If God was wrong, how can we know anything was right? God is supposed to be all-knowing and absolute, and if proof exists that God's word was not absolute, then what if God isn't actually real at all? This sort of doubt is enough to send someone spiraling. A world that was previously cleanly laid out in scripture becomes suddenly unknowable and confusing. To put it scientifically, it really throws us out of whack. <gasps> Gradually, man has become a fantastic animal that has to fulfill one more condition of existence than any other animal. Man has to believe, to know from time to time, why he exists. His race cannot flourish without a periodic trust in life. This need for belief is the very same as the need for meaning, and throughout history, the most common means of fulfilling this need was religion. This is most often done through the conception of a true world, an existence beyond our own that is free of the pain and suffering that the current, imperfect world is rife with. By living and acting a certain way, passage to the true world can eventually be obtained, and thus, the meaning of life is to work towards obtaining that true world. The classic example of this is the Christian heaven, a pure realm beyond our own that can only be obtained through living correctly, and following the way of life prescribed by the Bible and church. That is to say, extensions of God itself. After all, it's generally reassuring to have an omnipotent architect guiding you in the right direction. Lose that reassurance, and well... That's where nihilism springs up. Religious crisis is the most common catalyst for nihilism, but it needs to be noted that religion is not the only construct one might center their faith around. Political beliefs are another almost equally widespread structure that people use to orient their lives. Have you ever met one of those guys that's a really vehement atheist, like totally 100% rejects the notion of God and the church, mocks people that do believe the whole nine yards, but then they're also like really into Jordan Peterson or Andrew Tate or some other far-right grifter? Yeah, that's a pretty good example of how people can have different focuses of their faith beyond religion. Really, they're just swapping one daddy telling them what to do for another. But to get more serious for a minute, the fact that political theories and figures, especially the totalitarian ones, can inspire the same sort of dogmatic belief as religion is why so many political ideologies have been very, very dangerous across history. They also tend to prescribe specific and correct ways to think and live, and promise a release from suffering and pain through obedience. If only we all could just live right, then we'd be able to have that perfect utopian world, that true world where things are as they should be. Thing is, Political ideologies assert that the current material world is going to become the true world once everything falls in line and their group gains enough power. It's pretty easy to draw a straight line to violence and the eradication of people who cannot or will not conform from there. In Final Fantasy XIV, we see this mainly in Garlemald. The Garlean Empire is expressly non-religious. The worship of any sort of deity is strictly forbidden. When a nation-state is forced into the Empire via conquest, faith is violently punished and methodically stomped out. The impetus for this is, at least on paper, to prevent the creation of primals and the destruction and tempering that follows in their wake. Garlemald portrays itself as a logical solution to the danger posed by dogmatic Aorzean savages. However, the endpoint of the Empire is Anima, another primal, another false god. This makes it very clear that Garlemald isn't a solution or anything of the sort. It's just another option. It's just another system of belief from which people can derive meaning. Faith in a god and faith in an emperor are very similar, and both can be twisted into big scary monsters that the Warrior of Light has to fight. As such, the fallout of Garlemald's destruction is similar to the loss of faith in religion. Key point being, both bring on extreme despair and a vacuum of purpose that kickstarts people into nihilism. Just like with the challenge and subsequent doubt of the divine, an individual may be stripped of the meaning around which they have oriented their life when a political system is shown to be fallible or break down. Now that they've found themselves on the road to nihilism, there are only two real paths they can take. 
The first is to escape nihilism by going back the way they came, returning to the previous system of faith and finding new meaning in it, or swapping it out for another prepackaged ideology or religion. But if an individual finds themselves unwilling or unable to return to their previous systems of belief, the second option is to accept nihilism and, in so doing, come to the conclusion that there is no meaning to existence. The second path is not necessarily superior. It almost inevitably leads to some amount of misery, as it deprives one of the meaning that humans require to flourish, to have faith in the universe and their existence. But it's not all bad, as we'll see. Before that, though, let's break from our lesson for a moment to examine how this relates to Hermes. Unable to find meaning in his existence within ancient society on Aetherus, he seeks meaning on other stars, a quite literal example of searching for a true world. If happiness cannot be found where he is, then surely there exists a better place where it does. Unfortunately, Medion only brings him grim tidings, and Hermes is forced off the route of escapism and into the path of acceptance. The world is meaningless, there's no reason for the endless suffering within, no light exists amidst the stars to soothe him, like an animal deprived of water or food, bereft of belief. Hermes slips into the villain we know now as Van Daniel, choosing not only to lay down and die, but to allow Medion to take the world with them. This is a rather faithful recreation of the impetus for nihilism's grim reputation. But as we brushed against before, it's often overlooked that nihilism is not a system of belief meant to sustain, rather, it's a transitional period. Dwelling only on the death of belief and the lack of meaning is a one-way ticket to pessimism and misery. It's as harmful as denying yourself social interaction, or refusing to take adult multivitamins with iron despite the iron deficiency that's as clear as the purple on your nail beds. So following the path of acceptance, we come to the often overlooked dichotomy of active and passive nihilism. Passive nihilism is straightforward. It's what we just described, the rejection of any meaning and a subsequent descent into despair. It's not just the belief that there is no inherent meaning in the universe, but further that all existence is just meaningless. And mind you, there's a rather large difference between those two things. Inherent meaning would be the existence of a true world, a correct way to live, and a specific reason for human life, and further, the universe's existence. A cosmic truth, if you will. The lack of inherent meaning that nihilism posits, however, does not mean that everything is meaningless. Baking cookies with your grandma because it makes her happy is not declared meaningless by nihilism, but rather by the passive nihilist that's chosen to give up on their journey through nihilism. It's an understandable reaction, really. Belief is akin to sustenance for the human heart, and coming to the conclusion that everything you thought fundamental about the world is a lie is a harrowing experience. It can shake us to our very core and throw everything we worked for or aspired to be into disarray. The very way one has lived their life could come crashing down around them, and that's a hard hit to recover from. Needless to say, passive nihilism is not the optimal endpoint. It's more like a trap one can fall into, one someone might be more susceptible to when they aren't receiving proper support or their material needs aren't being met. This would be the sect that Hermes and, by association, Medion fall into. Faced with the lack of meaning on both Aetherus and amidst the stars, they give up on the notion that there's any point to life. Further, the horrors that the Matea report cause the two to fall into philosophical pessimism. The belief that the universe contains pain in great abundance over pleasure, and that life is ultimately a cruel and irredeemable experience that is largely not worth the trouble. The Matea's response, guided by the anguished wishes for release that the suffering inflicted upon her, is to bring about not only the final days, but to hoard all souls in the life stream in a place between death and rebirth while slowly pushing the universe to its natural, completely inhospitable end. In essence, Medion has come to a sort of antinatalism, the belief that creation of new life is inherently a cruel act that must be stopped, as life is mainly suffering. While she eschews the traditional anti-procreation stance for reaping and hoarding souls inside her nest, hers is still fundamentally the belief that no new life should emerge. So if we're meant to rebuke Medion's pessimism, wherein lies our answer? What should one strive for when they have accepted that the universe has no inherent meaning? What hope is there beyond that empty despair? This is where active nihilism becomes a driving force in the conversation. Set as the diametric opposite to passive nihilism, Nietzsche saw the active nihilist as one who recognizes the meaninglessness of the universe and chooses instead to assert their own meaning, rather than relying on an external means for justifying existence, or instead free to build our own, to assess the world as we know it, and come to our own conclusions about what matters. Active nihilism can be a very freeing experience. With the laws of the universe we once thought fundamental now ringing hollow, we can 
can free ourselves from tradition and obligation that once bound us. Family, while for some a source of love and support, can prove toxic for others. The recognition that there's no inherent need to maintain bonds of blood if they hurt you has sent many on the course for better lives. Other roles and traditions that individuals might have found themselves incongruent for and unhappy in become a choice rather than a set path. Maybe academic and professional achievement aren't as important as we're led to believe. Why should a promotion be more important than the painting of a flower you made last weekend? Now, active nihilism is not necessarily defined by breaking from tradition. One may very well find meaning in the same virtues they practiced prior to their transition. Many religions extol things like honesty, courage, and charity, and people who have left those religions might as well. Moving on from a framework of faith through nihilism doesn't necessarily mean completely reversing your values. The emphasis here is on why you believe in those things, as in, did a higher being tell you these were important, or did you decide that for yourself? That's the core journey through active nihilism, the impetus for your beliefs and meanings changing from external to internal. Julius is a character who has devoted his entire life to the Garlean Empire. While religion is prohibited on a surface level, Garlemald itself is an object of devotion, think anima. With its Xenos-induced fall, Julis faces down deep despair and the death of meaning, all while grappling with the fact that outsiders from across Eorzea are not the land-hungry fiends he'd always been taught they were. He's burdened with intense tragedy and loss, but ultimately saved from despair's influence by his ability to accept a shift in paradigm, and let go of his preconceived notions about the world's inner workings. Survival and aid become his meaning for the time, easy decisions to come to in a crisis. The weight he carries can't be easily swept aside by new understanding, but the shift here does allow him to accept help and regain hope. Julius will no doubt face many trials, both physical and mental, as peace settles, but the growth he exhibits here will guide him well. The meaning he finds for the time is likely going to be in helping aid the surviving Garleans and rebuild the homes they share. Though it's not far from his initial service to the Empire, it's now directly focused on helping people, not blindly helping an Empire. And this expanded view and understanding of the world makes an incredible difference. While it challenges everything he ever knew, it's ultimately what frees him. Maybe Garlemald as a structure was deeply flawed, abjectly cruel, and destined to fall from the start, but that doesn't mean its people aren't worthwhile. The most important aspect of this view of active nihilism is that we find ourselves as the masters of our own existence, free to assert our own purpose in life. In a word, our answer. This is what Vana and the game as a whole is asking you to tell them, your reason for living. It's what you must deliver to Medion at the edge of the universe, to convince her that life still has its purpose despite the suffering. But admittedly, what I've laid out before you isn't the classical version of active nihilism. Rather, it's a progression of the original concept. This is because Endwalker also rejects classical active nihilism, quite specifically. In fact, it has an entire character devoted to showing you what Nietzsche's proposed answer answer was, and why it was wrong. And that means it's time to talk about the big blonde elephant in the room. In his writings on nihilism, Nietzsche did offer an answer, specifically a correct choice to make when faced with the overwhelming terror of a meaningless universe. In order to nourish the human psyche as necessary, one must create their own meaning. This sect is active nihilism, as we just outlined. While there are quite a few subsequent scholars that have weighed in on the matter, for the moment we'll focus on Nietzsche's original beliefs and writings. Because meaning must be found and erected by the self, meaning must be the self. This was Nietzsche's original response to nihilism, a focus on the individual, on bettering oneself and in so doing, finding a reason to exist and continue on. The goal of a single person should be to live up to their full potential, to reach the highest possible caliber of existence that they could manage. Nietzsche believed that the true fulfillment of such a thing was incredibly rare and unheard of among those who did not make it a specific goal. He was quite fixated on this idea, the concept of great men that could do what few others could. Never forget, he also coined the term Ubermensch. Unfortunately, this fixation and his beliefs surrounding it are what I dislike about Nietzsche's philosophy in general. He believed that few people actually tried to live up to their potential, and that people tended to be held back by fear and laziness. Now, forgive me for my skepticism, but whenever I hear someone posit that people are being lazy when not achieving as much as they should, it raises red flags. While it's true some people care little for self-improvement and legitimately are mired by sloth, most people written off in this way are those that face under-recognized challenges and setbacks. Chronic illness, a lack of generational wealth, obligations to family, 
family, and myriad other duties and detriments that are commonplace in our society prevent many from pursuing the type of learned elite role that Nietzsche heralded as the universal ideal. Further, I find myself questioning what exactly he considered fulfilling one's potential to be, seeing as he had a bit of a detached and cruel nature and more than a bit of a misogynistic streak. The traits he considered worth pursuing, like logic and philosophy, are notably things he himself already highly valued. I sense a bit of bias in his conclusions, is what I'm trying to say. Let me be straightforward. Nietzsche often referred to people as sheep or other livestock, and were he alive today, I have little doubt that he'd be very into the NPC meme. Mired in the ideals of his time or not, I don't take advice from people lacking compassion, and I would advise you not to either. But this video isn't about criticizing philosophers. It's about the hit MMORPG Final Fantasy XIV, the one with the free trial and the b So let's get back to the game's narrative and look at someone who not only lives as Nietzsche prescribed, but exemplifies all the flaws that rise from such a way of thinking. There's truly only one freak deranged enough to serve as the shiny example we need, and that's none other than Garlemald's golden boy, Xenos Ye Galvis. Xenos is an interesting character in Endwalker, in that he doesn't always get to be a character. From my perspective, at least, he seems to be more a vehicle by which themes are explored and delivered than an active agent in most of the story. And when I say he delivers themes, I don't just mean that scene in Garlemald, in part because the answer he gives there is specifically harpooned as incorrect. No, Xenos is more like an anti-theme, the wrong interpretation of the right answer. In many ways, he exemplifies Nietzsche's own interpretation of purpose purpose and personal fulfillment. Not only is he a well-read intellectual, but he has reached the pinnacle of his chosen discipline. Ever since his introduction in Stormblood, Xenos is the only soul that can match, and even best, the protagonist in combat. He's the strongest human alive, to such a degree that he is tormented by the lack of an equal, ever in search for a challenge. And when he finds one in the Warrior of Light, he becomes obsessed with chasing the thrill of being equally matched. In short, Xenos has reached the top, and he's lonely there. From the moment he's introduced, Xenos is bored, lonely, and miserable. He is utterly miserable in his existence. He made the conquest of power and the thrill of the hunt his reason for living. And now, when he's reached the pinnacle, his abilities honed to such a fine point that even entire armies bend and break beneath his boot, much like the Omicrons, he has nowhere left to go. All he does is lays about on Alamigo's throne day in and day out. Subjugating nations means little to him, serving Garlem even less. All he cares for is his contest of choice. He wants to fight and be challenged, to reforge himself in flame and come out stronger. But no one can match him. No one is strong enough to provide him that thrill. Xenos is a person who, for all his poetic waxing and book learning, is surprisingly simple and straightforward. He wants one thing, and he's willing to burn down anything in his path to get it. So he places Yotsuyu, a woman similarly obsessed and tormented, into the role of Doma's viceroy. He doesn't care about stability. He actively wants Yotsuyu to terrorize the nation in hopes of a rebellion rising, in hopes that someone within might be a match for him. It works eventually, and in the Warrior of Light he finally finds that match. Something to live for. The fixation he develops on the Warrior of Light is what betrays the cracks in his philosophy. He frauds and foams, obsesses and toils without end to relive that battle in the Royal Menagerie. He repeats the havoc he wrought on Doma on a universal scale in an attempt to goad the player into a rematch. And ultimately, he fails. He causes untold suffering, destroys Garlemald, and ferries Fandaniel's fate to fruition for nothing. And when Julis asks him to face his sins, he's unrepentant. This scene is interesting, and it's part of the reason that I say Xenos feels more like a tool for plot and thematic progression than a character in Endwalker. Many hail this as a slam dunk moment for him, a triumphant case of the worst person you know making an excellent point. And while I won't totally discredit everything he says, I think the game makes it very clear that Xenos is wrong here. Alize is the one in the right. Xenos may have the clear, calmly spoken rhetoric of a seasoned debate bro, but Alize's impassioned rebuke of his philosophy is the stance championed by the narrative as a whole. In short, Xenos took the right path to the wrong conclusion. He's right when he asserts that no one can give you a purpose but yourself. That's textbook active nihilism, which legitimately is the best way to avoid falling into despair and philosophical pessimism. But as Alize highlights, the meaning he chose is bankrupt and self-defeating. For all his confidence in his methods and desires, Xenos has unknowingly been responsible for his own misery. His bitted happiness, his unending pursuit of greater strength and more worthy prey, none of it ever actually made him happy. Happy. What finally granted him joy and fulfillment was the Warrior of Light, but not because he found in them a worthy opponent. 
Despite everything he is and everything he's done, Xenos is still human. Like every other Makote, Garlean, or Matanga, he is a fundamentally social creature, and as such, Xenos shares the same need for positive social interaction and companionship that all people have. To make something absolutely clear, this is a fact. Humans evolved as social animals, and social interaction has come to be understood as a need in the same vein as food or shelter. We are so sensitive and wanting for love and connection that when we experience social rejection, it activates the same part of our brains responsible for processing physical pain. The lack of these connections, of something we so deeply need, it's an affliction that can be likened to illness or poisoning. Our reaction to the lack of companionship is more than mental, it's bone deep. Loneliness in humans has been shown to correlate with an increase in the inflammation of somatic cells and a decrease in our body's antiviral response, a dampening of our immune system brought about not by infectious disease or injury, but by a lack of company. Loneliness represents a signal that a need is unfulfilled, which produces a drive to seek social contact, just as hunger produces a drive to seek food. This in contrast to other views on loneliness, which conceptualizes it simply as an averse condition without redeeming features. However, if loneliness indeed represents a drive such as hunger or thirst, it should be represented in the brain in a similar way as other basic drives, the biological implementation of which may be termed social homeostasis. Socialization is more than a pastime, it's a part of bodily and psychological maintenance. Prolonged isolation, such as solitary confinement in jails, is classified as torture because of the myriad short and long-term effects it can have on physical and mental health. When deprived of social and external stimuli, even for short periods, previously healthy individuals developed panic disorders, depression, hallucinations, and even suicidal ideation. Similar afflictions were shown to occur in social mammals such as rodents when isolated. When adolescent rats were deprived of social contact with others, their long-term behaviors and ability to socialize were severely affected. Even the development of their brains was found to be stunted when compared to that of their socialized peers. This is all to say that companionship is a need. We, like so many other species on this planet, are not meant to be alone. I hesitate to attribute most behaviors and preferences to an innate human nature, as bioessentialism is generally a fraught and dangerous school of thought. But when it comes to our desire and need for social interaction, it is indeed a matter of our base programming as humans. We evolved for community, and when deprived of connection, we wither and fade. Xenos, in spurning all those around him due to a perceived inferiority, has created a hell of his own design. His interpersonal woes may have started in childhood at the hands of irresponsible and unfit caretakers, but he's only perpetuated his own misery through the development of his twisted personal philosophy wherein the thrill of the hunt and of respect for combat prowess comes before all else. No one is his equal, no one provides him a satisfying fight, and as such, he takes interest in no one. He barely notices the people around him, perceiving them as lesser, subhuman when set beside him. In doing so, he's isolated himself utterly. In that isolation, he finds little but boredom and misery. Xenos' psyche is stunted, his capacity for compassion non-existent. He's the resident of a barren garden, forever frustrated by its lack of fruit, anguished by every sprout he plucks from the ground as it fails to flourish. He's driven by a deep hunger, and yet he never finds it fulfilled. One could argue that Xenos' desire, and what he finds in the Warrior of Light, is not companionship, but merely a challenge, as he espoused time and again through Stormblood and Endwalker. Yet, Xenos himself, in some of his final moments, states much the opposite. Ha! Acceptance! At long last! In the end, it's not a worthy opponent or a grand challenge that Zeno celebrates, but the bond between himself and the Warrior of Light, and the wall's recognition of it. His very presence at Creation's Edge necessitates his own admittance of ideological defeat. He cannot burn a path through the cosmos, he cannot cut his way through the stars. To reach the Warrior of Light, he has to compromise. He must meet Kryl on her own level, recognize her value and talent, talent which lies outside of physical combat, and rely on the good nature and generosity of another. Not even the pinnacle of humanity can attain his desires, his happiness, alone. The flaws and foibles which you so abhor are what make us who we are. Every nation, even yours, Emperor Varys, is made whole through the combination of these imperfections, the strengths of one compensating for the weaknesses of another. While it is true that man succumbs all too often to anger and avarice, 
He may yet overcome his baser instincts through the forming of bonds with others, fostering community and cooperation. Even a being as mighty as Xenos has weaknesses. Even he possesses flaws which he must rely on others to make up for. In finally understanding and accepting this, he grows at the story's end. He realizes what he actually wants, what the meaning of his desire for the Warrior of Light is. With the importance of that bond known to him, he admits defeat and accepts help from another. This is, without a doubt, an immensely positive development. Not only in how it falls in line with the story's greater themes, but also in its direct tie into actions which save the universe. It is, after all, the bonds that the Warrior of Light has fostered throughout their journey which ultimately allow the universe to be saved. From the allied nations working together to gather Alligan materials, to the Scion's belief in the player and sacrifices in Ultima Thule, culminating in the worst man alive finally coming to the understanding of his failings and spending his last hours helping another person for the first time. Community, cooperation, and communication are vital. Not just to succeeding, not just to surviving, but to the very hope which pulses through Endwalker's narrative, to finding a reason to continue on in the face of despair. Unlike the inheritance of souls or gathering of Aether, this is a concept and a truth that can resonate with the real lives of those who play 14. This is a fundamental piece of the human experience, our need for connection, and the ways in which our bonds with others can nurture and empower us. This belief is the lifeblood of Endwalker and 14 as a whole, and I think it's worth examining the ways that the technical foundations of the game exemplify these ideas. This might come as a surprise when we're 10,000 words deep in an essay about an MMO, but I'm not an MMO guy. Prior to 14, I had never played one, and I pretty much just assumed that they weren't for me. After all, what is the MMO experience? My perception of them was formed composite from a slew of secondary sources, TV shows, books, movies. The closest I had to any real experience was my childhood friend's parents, who were big into WoW in the 2000s when I was growing up. That all added to this vision of this relentless hardcore game, hours upon hours spent grinding out rare items or experience. Most of all, they were framed by popular media as wastes of time, sinkholes that antisocial wrecks threw their time into while ignoring the real world. Why would I ever want to play something like that? So let's ignore that uncharitable read, as I was a kid and clearly things have changed, but I really didn't understand much about MMOs until a year and a half ago. Compared to many longtime players across games, my time spent with the genre is relatively short, but I like to think that between my own experience and the tutelage I've received from some longtime WoW veterans, I understand a little bit. I think it's also worth noting that my playtime was heavily concentrated in the first year, and I accumulated roughly 1,512 hours in game last year, or in other words, 63 days. Or in other other words, a sixth of the year. More on that later. From the outset, one of the most striking features of the game was how intensely social it is. And yeah, forgive me, my naivety here. Massively multiplayer is literally in the name. I should have seen that one coming. The game is just that though, a massively multiplayer experience wherein you're seldom ever truly alone. Load into the game, travel between data centers or worlds, and you'll pop into one of the etherite plazas surrounded by myriad other players, some idling, some on their way, and some sort of just hanging out playing music or interacting with others. And sure, this is a nifty sort of town square experience, but there's a lot more to the interactivity in this game. Core gameplay, such as dungeons and raids, are reliant on multiplayer capability, group cooperation and effort to reach successful outcomes. While the continued implementation of the trust system is allowing people to progress through the main story without external help, that alone doesn't really stop 14 from being a social experience no matter how you slice it. Level a crafter and you're likely to find the guild hub full of other practitioners of the trade. Busy at work with their tools and tables, it makes the area feel more like a bustling workshop than the NPCs ever do. Leveling a gatherer in Ishgard's diadem often comes with some matter of chatter in the local yell channel. Even if you can't directly see the other players mining and fishing alongside you, there's still a distinct and often silly presence as people ask for music recommendations or play farcical games of Marco Polo. Even just existing in the overworld can become an interaction. Other players might emote at you, or send you a tell that they like your glam, or join in on a fight that you've been fighting alone. 
And what I'm describing here, these are just edge cases where the game becomes social despite your best efforts to have a solo experience. These minor interactions say nothing of the way that cooperation and social interaction are the beating heart of 14 and its contemporaries. A theoretical attempt to play the game without ever interacting with others would eliminate raids, free companies, treasure hunts, hunt trains, and myriad other experiences that elevate the game beyond a visual novel and into a truly expansive and unique experience. The game is social by nature, asking you to cooperate with others for a base level enjoyment, and rewarding you with richer and more exciting experiences the more you branch out and find others to play with. This focus on interaction socialization is what makes MMOs, 14 among them, strange but nonetheless legitimate third places. A third place in this context is a term used in sociology to describe an area unique from home or work that provides a space for facilitating social interaction and relationship building. Think pubs with happy hours or bowling alleys. Their places where hanging out and having fun are the entire point. While non-traditional due to the digital nature, MMOs do in fact meet the criteria and serve the same purpose as physical third places. A 2006 study led by Constance Steinkuhler and Dimitri Williams investigated the ways in which MMOs satisfy the eight criteria of third places as defined in Oldenburg's original work on the matter. In doing so, their study cuts straight to the core of the social function in these games, emphasizing the key role communication plays within games like 14. For most gamers, constant conversation through myriad chat channels is not only necessary to navigate the virtual world's diverse challenges, such as to barter virtual goods, to organize collaborations, to share information, but the very fodder from which individuals create and maintain relationships of status and solidarity, and in part, in-game community and cultural norms. In virtual worlds, gameplay is constituted not only by joint in-game activities, but also and overwhelmingly by constant conversation about the game and topics well beyond it, running from debates about the mechanics of the game and discussions of who did what to whom, to lively conversations about art, culture, sex, and politics, so much so that MUD developer J.C. Lawrence states, the basic medium of multiplayer games is communication. 14 is expansive and intensely social. For the vast majority of users, it's not just about running dungeons and getting the best gear. It's about the experiences beyond base gameplay. A 24-man raid can become a themed event, like an all-male aura run for Valentine's Day. A free company house can be transformed into a venue specifically for role-playing. A digital restaurant fit with both staff and patrons that becomes a sort of collaborative and interactive theater event. An in-game wedding can be a social event for messing around, or it can be a digital stand-in for an actual ceremony, when a couple can't yet have a proper wedding due to cost or laws or distance. With such diverse and extensive avenues for interaction, it's no wonder that a unique culture has cropped up in and around 14. By its very nature, the game encourages socialization, be that casually as yourself or by taking on a created persona, a character based on your avatar and the world around them. The main story of the game furthers this, casting you not as a pre-rendered protagonist, protagonist with set ideals and experiences, but as you, as your character, and whoever you want them to be. It's not the most original idea in the world or anything, but it's well executed here, in no small part due to the community and culture around the game. In a lot of ways, it is the best that I've ever seen, not just in implementation in the game itself, but in the wider social circles around it. And to pull back and put it into perspective, I've been on the internet a long time. Like, a really long time. When I was a child, the internet and home computers were still relatively new phenomena. If your family had a computer, it was a big clunky unit that had its own room or corner, and literally anything it did was novel and awe-inspiring. When I was lucky enough to commandeer it, I would be playing Space Pinball or Neopets or Flash games on Congregate.com. Eventually, I realized that you could find anime on the internet, and that avenue would lead me to forms, and most relevantly, the role-playing section of various nerd forms. Even as a little kid, I loved making up my own characters to put into the fantastical worlds I saw in anime and video games. Back in elementary school, the neighborhood kids and I would watch Naruto on Toonami on Saturday nights and fill the rest of our evenings making up storylines and playing as our own original characters. I can only imagine what my neighbors must have thought while watching us run around making indecipherable hand symbols and yelling, Fireball Jutsu. 
In my youth, I was on just about every platform imaginable playing as fan characters. Forms, Skype, MSPARP, Tumblr, you name it. And while it was all very fun, there was always a haze that lingered, an invisible threat that fan communities at large seem to abide by and uphold without question. It lurked in the shadows, silent and watchful, keeping out of the way until it was time to swing the hammer and demolish any dissent. The term Mary Sue didn't originate in roleplay forms, but it did come to rule them. Its ugly reign clouded online spaces in general, slowly cementing itself as a schema everyone had to live by if they wanted to inhabit and create in these spaces. Its doctrine enforced a sort of requisite banality, a strong-armed admission of humility that must be signed before moving forward. Your character can be cool, but not too cool. They can be powerful, but never too powerful. We'll allow purple hair, but god forbid rainbow stripes. That's just too far. It's over the line. It's beyond the limits of reasonable belief, and dare I say, god mode. This judgment is beyond reproach, and we expect you to cease your current activities and begin major revisions. It's for the good of the community that we all follow this formula. You'll never be accepted if you don't respect the rules, and you're making the rest of us look bad. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. It isn't as if the looming phantom of Mary Sue allegations is a living, breathing force with a conscience of its own. It always was just a tool to bully people with. It was a widely said spread of vague and often contradictory parameters that could be used to beat someone over the head with, and bring them to heel if you decided you didn't like their toy dolls. The thorny bramble grew from a kernel of truth. Sometimes people make characters that are super powerful, loved by all, and absolute heroes that proposed canon bends around. Like, if you've ever been in an RP group before, you've probably encountered some guy who says his character wins every fight and gets every girl. There really are people like that out there. I mean, who do you think harem anime and like Sword Art Online are appealing to? But those people are usually children, and when you get down to it, the stakes really aren't so high as to warrant any of the abuse. If someone shows up to a tabletop game with a character already at level 20, you don't have to play with them, and a tween's emo sparkle wolf on DeviantArt can't hurt you. There really wasn't a need for the Mary Sue hysteria that swept through the internet around the early 10s. It was just people being mean to each other. I don't want to frame this as a specific instance of some people being bullies and others victims, because with how pervasive this stuff was, a lot of the people that fell victim to it turned around and perpetuated those beliefs themselves. Being a little nerd on the internet at the time made it really easy to internalize a vague conception of character rules and train yourself to abide by them like gospel. Even if the term Mary Sue has started Started to disappear, its impact still shaped a lot of online communities and set a precedent for a lot of people, whether they realize it or not. So that's all to say that I think it's really interesting how 14 makes the player a Mary Sue, but it's slash pause this time. The main character is good at everything, beloved by all, and a destined hero whose soul is tied up in the fate of the universe. The world revolves around the player, it's like the most basic fact of the game. Sure, nothing's stopping you from deciding to tweak your character lore and selectively choose what is and isn't canon for you specifically, but the base state is very much within that Mary Sue criteria, and it rocks. So then, what does a community built around that starting point look like? This is an MMO after all, there's bound to be a vibrant roleplay scene, and more than a few people developing lore and creating art related to their characters. How do thousands of people get along when everyone very rightfully has main character syndrome? Based on the time that I've spent on Final Fantasy Twitter, they all coexist surprisingly well. I really think 14 has one of the most fascinating fan ecosystems out there. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, so let me lay down a little bit of groundwork. When I began to get deeply invested in the story of the MSQ, I made a side account on Twitter to quarantine spoilers and occasionally gush about my Warrior of Light. The friends I was playing through the MSQ with were all big D&D nerds, so we had fleshed out our characters quite a bit, and I didn't want to flood my main Twitter account with musings about a magic lizard man. So I made myself a place to put it, and to no one's surprise, countless other people have done the same thing. A good chunk of the 14 fandom on Twitter is made up of people who really love their walls, and have written rich and varied stories surrounding them. Oftentimes, people have side accounts specifically for posting about the game and their character. This can be anything from long threads detailing a character's backstory, to themed photo shoots using the in-game camera mode, to oodles of illustrations and writings based on prompt challenges, or done just because of the mood struck. A major aspect of the community is wool questions, prompts about various aspects of life and lore meant to be retweeted with answers about one's own character. This might be anything from weighty asks like what was their lowest point in the story, to 
prompts entirely for fun, like what would your wool's partner Pokemon be? Maybe it's just that I'm not an MMO guy or I haven't ever been in the right places, but I've never in my life seen a community so open and interested in sharing character lore. Most people seem to love hearing about each other's wolves, and everyone is encouraged to share their ideas. There's a widespread acceptance of variable canon. Yeah, your character was indeed the Warrior of Light. They did all those things, and so was mine. There's no need to argue over who is or isn't the main character. We all are. Further, with each person acting as the arbiter of their own story, there's celebration of canon's flexibility. 14's set narrative isn't going to accommodate every single personality and backstory. For example, my wool grew up on the Azim Steppe, so it's always a little weird when characters over-explain the area to him. So why consider those conversations canon? Why not just decide that things went down differently? The general consensus is it's all malleable. The changes each person brings with their character provide a new perspective and additional avenues to explore the story through. Maybe in your canon, Ahuan survived and you've put a lot of work into building what his post-Endwalker life looked like. Or perhaps your wall retained their memories of life as an ancient and has to grapple with being split between two worlds. Maybe your character isn't even the Warrior of Light, they're just some farm boy doing their best in a post dalamud world. The possibilities are endless, and each makes the game the world provides more lived in. Every character brings their own unique focus and angles to the story, plots a bit more of Eorzea's map. What to one person might be a forgettable NPC or locale is to another an inextricable part of their character's life and story. Sure, none of it is official, but that doesn't really matter. The meaning and sheer joy of creation and collaboration shared isn't lessened by a lack of reflection in the game proper. In the same way that a D&D character can mean so much to you despite being little more than a stat block and words shared between friends, wolves can become extremely beloved by their creator and cohorts. That kind of interaction between fandom and work is special and the sheer scope of its scene in 14 is nothing short of breathtaking. That the game can inspire so much creation, can compel so many to create and dream, it's a testament to the strength of 14 as a whole. It's not surprising that the property would garner such an invested player base. MMOs tend to be high commitment games to begin with, and in many ways, 14 pioneered thoughtful and complex storytelling within the genre. People are going to care all the more about grinding out 90 levels of Dark Knight when the side story that goes with it is an emotional powerhouse. You combine that richness of world and characters with the human love of storytelling and the social nature of MMOs, and you get something truly special. You get Final Fantasy XIV. What already functions as a social bridge, a digital third space meant for people to hang out in and have fun in, becomes a compelling force for artistic expression. It's no surprise that some of the biggest in-game social events are art parties, group hangouts, often with costumes and themes, dedicated to chilling and drawing each other. The union of gameplay and personal creation goes so, so much further. Entire free companies are dedicated to roleplay, and swaths of housing plots are made to serve as mock-ups of third places, further nodding to the social functionality of the game. To argue that MMO gameplay is isolated and passive media consumption in place of informal social engagement is to ignore the nature of what participants actually do behind the computer screen. Gameplay is not a single, solitary interaction between an individual and a technology, contrary to worn-out stereotypes. In the case of MMOs, gameplay is more akin to playing five-person poker at a neighborhood tavern that is accessible from your own living room. An MMO is perhaps not the only way 14 could have told its story, but it is the best way. It is at heart social, a world inhabited not only by computer programmed monsters and heroes, but also by hundreds of thousands of people who see Eorzea as a second home, who collaborate and work together every day to overcome monumental challenges, or to design the perfect free company house, or just to hang out and enjoy an evening together. By setting itself within an MMO, 14 makes connection and community implicit parts of the gameplay experience. It fosters relationships and works on an engine of collaboration. And that very nature, that core of love and trust, tells us why, at the end of everything, it is connection that saves us, and by extension, the whole world. Why the ultimate challenge is a universal loneliness and the threat of vast silence. Because in the absence of connection, all we have is despair. Our lives are enriched by the way we share them with others, and if that ability to connect and share is taken away, the light grows dim. Xenos showed us the misery that comes from scorning the people around you. 
Hermes' tragedy is born in no small part from his isolation and his fervent desire to be understood. For as much as the game champions joy and connection, Endwalker wouldn't be the story it is without its acknowledgement and thorough examination of despair. Anyone who has played it needs no reminder of its perennial presence. It runs as a dark stream through the narrative, often a centerpiece and always an undeniable truth. It's easy to talk about despair as a hypothetical. When we talk about nihilism or isolation or ecological alienation, despair appears as a variable in a larger equation, a byproduct of greater, more cerebral concerns. It's the remainder of imperfect division, CO2 produced by a combustion reaction. It's simple to address in the abstract. When waters are calm and all is well, despair is easy to understand, to look past and rationalize. We sometimes believe we can, and others should, shake from its grasp through logic and determination. That life is ours to command and malaise can be ignored. But the reality of despair is far more consuming than its immaterial shadow. The crushing weight of anguish is a force that can render us immobile with ease. Every human, no matter how strong, is doomed to fall to its terror at least once in life. You've been there. You have. We all have. Fear and panic might eat away at our innards like worms, leaving behind an empty husk, unable to summon the will to move, the will to even think. The shell is decayed, a single touch enough to crack and cave the husk. Loss is never-ending, the pain of parting a sudden and stinging blade thrust through the stomach. Moments of cool, emotionless shock, filled by anguish that seeps to our core. Filled past full, we burst and wail, desperate for that which will never be again. Innumerable loves come and gone, precious pieces of our lives that change the shape of our hearts and incidental interlopers, fleeting and far away, but no less mourned in their absence. The empty shape they leave is more than a void, a pocket of pain, a burning sensation that scabs and scars, ideals unlived, potentials unreached, a thousand discarded hobbies, shriveled branches that never flowered. Worse yet are the rotten remains, soured apples and spoiled fruits we can no longer reach, spotted brown and green as they melt away. Had we not erred, had we been smarter, tried harder, things would have gone differently. In anger we can claw and snarl, spit venom and lay blame, yet in the dark of night, left alone with cloying thoughts and shredded hearts, it always comes home to roost. Shame pools, and we melt into mucus on the ground. Vile sick, forever self-damning, never enough, unable to achieve even the simplest of tasks. And how can we expect to be any better in a world so cruel? How are we meant to live and thrive while stuck beneath the heel of systems that want us to toil away as gears in a profit machine at best, and be executed for our very existence at worst? Every year the temperature rises and the hands tick closer to midnight, but the small councils hoarding the power of nations only care to ensure the fortune of the few. Righteous anger is made impotent and we're asked to ignore everyday existential nightmares. How are we meant to feel? What are we meant to do? Again and again it repeats. Happiness is fleeting, our return to the depths imminent. We seize and we shake and we claw. Pain unbearable fills our chests. As it chokes our breath and burns our bodies, we cry out for the answer to the question. Why, given life, are we meant to suffer? To die. In the face of soul-crushing pain, logic fails us and the mind itself wanes. We cannot rationalize our way out of suffering. It is inevitable. It always has been, and it shall continue to be. Emotional pain is just as wounding as physical pain for us, and the crushing weight of reality can be as crippling as crushed bone. Paradoxically, pain can be a horrifically effective motivator. Agony redirected outward can be the impetus of heinous acts, a folly we see time and again in the course of 14. Betrayal and loss drive Nidhogg to wage an endless war against Ishgard, his every assault inflicting yet more suffering and breeding a feedback loop of vengeance. Elidibus and the other Asians are so consumed by grief that they commit atrocity after atrocity in an attempt to bring back their home and brethren. Hermes feels so isolated in his despair that he eventually turns his back not just on the world, but the idea of life itself. It's all calculated and deliberate, but none of it is rational. Despair, rage, sorrow, all can be so overwhelming that they fundamentally disrupt the people that we are. Terrifying as it is, these emotions are still fundamental to us, always a lurking threat, an Achilles heel that could change us from hero to villain under the wrong set of circumstances. It's fitting, then, that the greatest villain, the big threat at the end of the journey, isn't an evil king or a fell dragon. It's a crystallized part of our psyche, hoarded universal despair. Every hopeless moment, every impulse to give up. The Ensinger is all of our darkest hours made manifest, now united in the singular goal of universal silence 
because oblivion must surely be better than the endless agony inherent to living. It has no real ambitions or thoughts of its own. Medion is an entelechy, a mirror that reflects the pure essence around her. She didn't want this destruction. We did. Maybe not now, or not in recent memory. But at some point, we all felt so beaten and bruised by the world that we wished for the end. In hindsight, the impulses are foolish and farcical, and yet they were real in the moment, in those bleak corners of our existence, so overcome by pain. Some part of us truly believed that non-existence was better than enduring further torment. One can only imagine how intense these calls for the end must have been from some of the planets she visited. Planets wasting away from pestilence and war, where the future could hardly be seen through the thick layers of rot and ruin. Ultima Thule, before it becomes tangible through Thancred's sacrifice, is described as less a place and more a patch of emptiness. And what better metaphor is there? Eventually, even the bombast of rage and despair give way, and in their wake is nothing. Emptiness. Hollowness. The spirit is gone, leaving an incomplete vessel without purpose. Sometimes all you want is to sleep, to turn off, shut down, and not deal with the weight of existence. I remember a question that floated around 14 Twitter a while back. It asked people to share the story of how they got into 14, and there were a whole lot of cute stories and fun responses to that. People talking about joining because of friends, or tumbling down the Dragon Age pipeline, or getting lured in by the omnipresent fan art of a red cat boy in 2019. I never posted a response because there's no cute anecdote about what got me to play 14. Yeah, I had friends and followers of this channel endlessly pitching it to me, but I wasn't an MMO guy, so I never heeded their recommendations. When I did finally pick it up, it was purely out of a desire for the horrible things I had thought about MMOs in my youth. I wanted a mindless, time-swallowing grind to take over my life for a little bit. I was desperate and tired, and I lacked the will to do literally anything. You might have caught on to this already if you've watched other videos here, but from 2020 to 2023, I worked in a COVID testing lab, and a small one at that. I don't think we ever had more than 120 people employed at once, between all three shifts, and never more than 60 people in the lab at one time. It was small and frantic, but there was an intense sense of purpose and camaraderie that we all shared. During the height of spikes and around holidays, our sample numbers would go through the roof. It's really hard to describe how it feels to walk in at 8am, throw on your lab coat, and find a veritable mountain of samples needing to be run within 48 hours. Racks of 93 samples in rows 4 deep and 5 high stretching across multiple tables. Taking a breath, and knowing all there is to do is get to work, move fast, and for the love of god don't spill anything. 8 hour shifts stretched to 10, sometimes 12. Yesterday's blisters popped and formed anew from the endless twisting of caps. Nagging pain in your wrist and shoulders from actions repeated ad infinitum. The hissing and whirring of each machine seared into your eardrums. And yet we all trucked on. This was doing our part. This was what it meant to work for the greater good, to shed blood, sweat, and tears in an effort to make things better. Because there was always someone waiting on that test. Someone scared, trying to make the best choice, needing to know if they and those around them needed to isolate. Occasionally we'd get a note. Someone would slip a thank you in with their test, a little gesture and acknowledgement of our work. Sometimes people went so far as to call us heroes. We hung those ones up on the wall. A little patchwork corner of cardstock and notebook scrap to brighten our day and remind us all why we worked so hard. Of course, we did get a bit of hate mail too. A test here and there filled with water or oil in protest. And even once, an accusation that we were collecting DNA for some shady government experiment. We laughed at those. We have tens of thousands of tests to run, let's get on with it. Summer 2021 was the first time things got quiet. There was a brief period where things seemed to be on the upswing, and testing slowed to a crawl. It made sense then that people would get laid off. The two rounds we did see were swift and cruel. There was no notice. People were there one day and then gone the next. We dutifully kept a graveyard, a collection of name tags taken from the lab coats of anyone who was let go. I personally ended up with a small garden of succulents that were left behind by people who lost their job, or in one case, died. Yeah, we were all just co-workers, but between the brutal workloads and the sense of purpose, we all shared a unique rapport and bond. We had each other's backs when, inevitably, fall and winter arrived with another wave, but this time, we had to face it understaffed. 
The heavy months were getting old by the holidays of 2021, though. By then we'd seen the waves and crashes a few times, seen mask mandates and general considerations loosen and fall, only for people to be gobsmacked at the rising cases a month later, seen politicians and conspiracy theorists push to declare the pandemic over, even as the cases continued to soar before our eyes. We ran the tests. We saw the numbers. We knew better than anyone that things weren't over. But we continued. We stood by dutifully through every wave, continuing to work overtime when the sample load demanded it of us. I spent my second Christmas in a row in the lab, and by January 2022, I was utterly exhausted. When I got home each day, I wanted something to distract me, to pour myself into and escape for a little bit. And lucky me! A kind friend just so happened to have an extra Final Fantasy XIV download code, purchased before Eorzea had shut its doors to new players. So they kindly snuck me in the back door, and I became an MMO guy for the first time in my life. But dreams of Eorzea couldn't distract me around the clock. I still existed in that Sisyphean lab, where no matter how hard we pushed, the positivity rate kept shooting back up. For the nth time, people were celebrating the end of the pandemic, even as I could see the numbers. Government moved towards shutting down testing programs, even as I could see the numbers. People threw out their masks and lost patience for social distancing, even as I could see the numbers. As a push to return to normal swept the nation, we finally got the break we'd longed for but it wasn't the relaxing sense of satisfaction we'd hoped it would be. It was an eerie, cruel silence. We hadn't beat the virus. I could see the numbers, and they weren't going down. The rich and powerful had just lost their patience and declared it over. Those in danger or unable to get care be damned. Compassion had dried up, and we were left to sit with the direct knowledge that things hadn't gotten better, while newscasters gave big, pearly white smiles and told people to throw caution to the wind. We did everything right, everything that was asked of us, and still, still it came to this. We sat dutifully, waiting for the next wave. But by the time it hit, they'd have cut money to testing. As with every lull, layoffs happened at a moment's notice. Cruel and cutting calculations made by higher-up states away who'd never even set foot in our lab. The group that had taken to playing Magic the Gathering during downtime disappeared one day. Then the folks from Processing, who'd turned the break room into a dazzling arts and crafts display, who had decorated the doors with construction paper for every holiday. This had happened before. Always sudden. It made sense. All we were doing was sitting and rotting, waiting for the phantom new projects the higher-ups had promised. I walked in one day, started maintenance on machines, only for my supervisor to arrive in a panic and inform me that I was one of only three people in the lab that day. The latest cut had left only 15 of us. People who joined when I did, at the lab's birth. Anyone who just barely had fallen under the cut to be hired by the company proper were gone. Fallen winter were quiet. There was still a sense of camaraderie among the survivors. In some ways, stronger than ever. Happy hours, spirited conversations, Pokemon Go, and shared commiseration at the circumstances we were left in. We'd all signed on under the pretense that this could be a career, that the lab would be converted into genetics testing. But each month eroded our trust a little further. The company had given us odd jobs here and there, all of which involved overflow and backlog from the central lab states away. Never anything of our own. Never anything lasting. January was quiet, and then in February, they finally pulled the trigger. I lost my job while writing this video. Unceremonious as ever, they rounded us up in a meeting room, and an exec flown in the night before told us that this was our last day. There was a really strange atmosphere as we all packed up our desks. There were tears, there was stress and uncertainty, but there was also laughter. For as much pain as there was, so too was there a sense of fond recollection. A toothache brought on by sickly sweet fondness for our memories. The relief in the release of a long-held breath. We said our goodbyes and removed our name tags from our coats, the last addition to that dutifully kept graveyard. And then we all found our way forward, the future unknown, fear abound at the sudden upset. But this was our reality. The sun would rise on a new morning and we would take our next steps. We had to, because life went on. It hurt, but not as much as it could have. I'd done a lot of my mourning earlier in the year, a depressive period that had stretched from January to June as the world burned and I watched my career crumble. I said it before, but I spent literally a sixth of 2022 playing Final Fantasy XIV. And wouldn't you know it, the lion's share of my time in game was within that period. That is by no means a good thing, but it's also the best I could do at the time. 
And well, I will be the first to say that no one should spend a sixth of their year playing an MMO, I also don't regret it for a lot of reasons. It compelled me to write and draw and socialize when I was barely making it out of bed in the morning. While playing Endwalker, I felt seen. There's been a lot of darkness lately, not just for me, but for everyone. I had my personal hell of inside knowledge as the country turned its back on protecting people and being left to rot and watching people dear to me disappear. But other people struggled too. So, so many people. So many challenges. So many setbacks. So many losses. I'm sure a lot of people had it rougher than me. Found themselves in more dire situations, or deeper holes, or just by virtue of brain chemistry, had an even harder time finding any light. That said, I don't think there's much of a point in quantifying suffering. There's no true metric for pain, especially not the emotional kind. No one's ever felt better by being told that someone else has it worse. A teen going through their very first breakup and a 30-year-old cutting off a six-year relationship could very well feel equally terrible. For as much as we might judge one of those situations as trite, the emotions experienced are no less real. History, maturity, mental fortitude, it all goes into how we experience life, and it changes from person to person as we age and learn more. A lot of us have probably come to a breaking point like Medeon's at some time. We've been in a place where the pain is so immense and unbearable that we can't see a way forward. Sometimes prospects get so dim that it seems like the only logical conclusion is to just give up. Even if they themselves are muddling through, I know a lot of people find the prospect of bringing new life into the current world horrific, and can sympathize with some antinatalist views. How can you blame them? The world is a mess. Living is hard. The unequivocal truth is that living guarantees us pain. Maybe it's true that to live is to suffer, to drink deep of calamity. But accepting the harshness of reality isn't the same as condemning it. We can see the world for what it is, swallow the inevitability of pain, and still find meaning and joy beyond that. Life isn't some grand scale wherein every sorrow counteracts an equal portion of happiness. No matter what we have to endure, we won't be stripped of our memories of love and laughter. The elation we felt in our life persists well beyond each tribulation. No matter how deep and dark we get, even if we lose everything, there's always another side. The dawn of a new day breaks, and we find new happiness beyond. The fact that you're here listening to these words is proof, because you've had moments where you felt like giving up on everything, and you didn't. You've endured every heartbreak that's led you to this point, and you're still here. There will be more. There's always more. But we'll weather that storm, and when the clouds clear, we'll find a way to rebuild and move on. And no matter how bad it gets, we'll find happiness again. We will. And God, above all else, know that you're never alone. Never truly. If there's one thing we can all be united in, it's pain. We're all stumbling through life, weathering light rains and vicious hurricanes as we move forward. The winds might tear at our skin, the flood might soak us to our bones, but there's nowhere so dark we can go that another hasn't tread before and that others won't tread after. We're all going through it, sometimes alone, but always together. Find the strength to reach out a hand, and you'll often find that another out there is willing to take it, or at least offer a shoulder to cry on. If you'd allow me one more aside, I want to show you something. There's this little corner of the internet, a YouTube video of the song Sticker Brush Symphony from Donkey Kong 64. It's simple, music played over a thorny bramble as clouds slowly drift across a blue sky in the background. I couldn't tell you how or why, but at some point it became known as the internet checkpoint. Whether you stumbled on it by chance or sought it out, the protocol was simple. You check in, you list your years, maybe your name if you're feeling daring, and take a moment to reflect on whatever tribulations are clouding your mind. There was never any official instructions or rules, but thousands of people agreed on and participated in this little ritual across the years. One person checked in with the challenges they'd faced during transition. Another reported on the listlessness they'd struggled with while going through university. Someone else chronicled the weeks since their breakup with a long-term partner. I'm not going to show any of these comments. The place feels too sacred to disturb with more than a screenshot of the video. But believe me when I say that every human struggle imaginable was recorded in that comment section. From the anxieties of middle schoolers to the existential dreads of middle-aged salarymen, any emotion could be found in that public diary. And yet, for every straight woe reported, there were twice as many entries tinged with hope. Oftentimes, paragraphs of text would end with the resolve to move forward, to take the steps needed to create a brighter life, or the writer expressing their commitment to gritting their teeth and enduring painful times. In some small way, I believe the togetherness there, the raw, honest expression of doubt and pain and hardship, 
gave a sort of comfort and strength to everyone who visited. Anonymous though it was, what better proof that we're all going through it together? If others can take hold of hope even amidst their despair, then what's to stop me, perhaps? Not all of the entries are dismal. Many people check in with updates, with positive improvements and excitement for the future. People report their victories, small and large, and the joys they found on the other side of despair. Trawling its depths, it's possible to find someone in a pit similar to your own, and to see how they've found their way out, or at least hear their voice across space and time, and feel their resolve to move forward. That sort of sentiment, those reflections of your own struggle, they're important. Is there any comfort more primordial than companionship? Than being seen, and understanding that your pain isn't as isolating as you might have believed it was? It's hard to overstate how much it can mean to know that there are people supporting you, or people that can sympathize with your plight. We're a social species after all, and nothing is more heartrending than being left on our own. So at all times, no matter how bleak it gets, we have to remember that we're not alone, not a single one of us. The feeling that we're aberrant or beyond hope of connection with others and the world around us is a creeping poison. The things we have in common with others far outnumber the factors that might set us apart. We're all united in so many ways, the inevitability of suffering and death among them. We're all gonna face hardship, we're all gonna find ourselves racked with pain, but we can all overcome it, and we all do so together every day. Seven million years in the making, 50,000 years of humanity as we know it, of emotions like our own, of fear and joy and sorrow and love. Feelings and consciousness recognizable to us resounding throughout history. Eight billion people existing alongside you, looking up at the same sky, the same stars. Each and every one of us struggling, attempting to find joy and meaning. Worlds apart, lives unfathomable. And yet all of us are united in our heartbreak and laughter, the universal language of humanity. So many have felt what you feel, stood where you stand. Never for a moment believe you're alone in this. To live is to suffer. That much is inevitable. But joy too is inevitable. For every tear shed, there'll be a reason to smile. For every day spent in agony, there'll be a day of laughter. If you've lost sight of these bright days, or you've come to believe they don't exist, your goal must be to hang on to hope. To believe beyond belief that sorrow ends. That nothing is ever truly over. As fragmented, imperfect beings, yours is a never-ending quest. A quest to find your purpose, knowing your end is assured. To find the strength to continue when all strength has left you. To find joy even as darkness descends, and amidst deepest despair, light everlasting. One of the first things we hear in Endwalker is Emmett Selk's voice, reciting what seems at first to be a sardonic appraisal of life as a whole. That which lives is destined to die. Love leads to loss. Every beginning has an end. Treasure every moment, every step of your descent. And like, it's Emmett, right? Doing what he does best, taunting us and reveling in our gloom. It's a delivery befitting the theatrical old queen he is. And yet, in true Emmett Selk fashion, there's a hidden meaning here. Hidden in plain sight. Because despite his tone, he's entirely sincere in his summation. Endwalker is all about proving his point, about confronting our own mortality, and how fleeting the joys of life can be, and that suffering is an inextricable part of the human condition. It's about looking at the pain you're promised and the pain you're experiencing dead in the eye and accepting it. There's a recognition in it, a simple acknowledgement of these truths. To live is to suffer, so it is, and as it ever has been. Lay it bare, take it in, let it rest. And still, there's sincerity here. A heartfelt bid, an earnest request that we love life, treasure every moment, every step of our descent. This is the sentimental wisdom of an old man who suffered and lost, but still recalls his life with fondness. He asks that we live, and that we enjoy living, despite the sting we feel from time to time. Heartbreak is proof that we possess hearts to be broken, pain a reminder that we yet draw breath. 
there's a sort of value that can come from pain. If not a net gain, then at least something positive wrung from the negative. It's not a novel idea, it's really one of the oldest ideas that we have as a species. Failure and suffering grant wisdom, a cosmic consolation prize for what we've gone through. And Walker even riffs on this idea. Know this, my children. There is more ugliness than beauty in this world. To live is to suffer. To drink of calamity and drown in anguish. To toil and be tested, always and ever. Tis a perilous path you walk. Death lurks in the dark, and is the sole promise that awaits at journey's end. You will tremble with terror. You will weep tears of anger and despair. But do not avert your eyes. See your life for what it is. Then will you see how the hardships make you strong. Every doubt reforged as scales for your armor. Every agony to temper your blade. It's true that pain can make you stronger. A broken bone can set harder than it was before, and surviving one ordeal can better equip you for the next. There's something so flesh-deep about the idea. Calluses replacing blisters over time, muscle that's torn and redoubled by continual effort. It's so viscerally alive and relevant to our existence as feeble mortal bodies that it comes pretty naturally. That, and the way that it gives a sense of meaning to our worst experiences. We may have suffered and wept and staggered, but it was worth it because we've come out stronger than we were. It mattered. There was a reason for the pain. It's sentiment that can turn a negative experience into something constructive. An odd sort of comfort, but an important one nonetheless. If we're destined to be knocked around by fate, then at least we'll get something out of it. Meaning, after all, is a need that we all share, and ultimately, it's something that we have to make for ourselves. So if suffering is assured, then why not find meaning in it? But I don't think this is the ultimate takeaway of Endwalker. The story absolutely pays credence to these ideas, but they're not the core thesis. Endwalker absolutely is not trying to tell us that we exist to suffer, and that in suffering we find true strength and purpose. It's a lot more realistic than that. It's too aware of how gut-wrenchingly awful these pains can be to suggest that this is the pinnacle of our existence and how we should define ourselves. Sometimes pain is just pain. A lot of people will quite rightfully scoff at the idea that despair and anguish have meanings. Trying to explain away every tragedy with it makes you stronger doesn't just ring hollow. It can be actively insulting. Sometimes you get hurt and it makes you worse. Sometimes it breaks you. What purpose is there in that? It's not noble. It doesn't grant us wisdom. It just hurts. So I wouldn't dare tell you that the meaning of life is to suffer. And this story wouldn't either. For as much as it dwells on calamity and ruin, Endwalker is ardently, uncompromisingly a story about hope. Philosophy and science aside, the story could not be more in your face with its message, its literal song of hope. Undeniably, Endwalker is a series of tragedies, of ending worlds. But there's always an after. People persisting despite their suffering, rebuilding and refusing to die. Because life goes on. So long as we live our story, our journey will never end. Dawn still rises after the blackest night, and it's not easy. Picking up the pieces, finding your feet again. It's hard, unfathomably so. But we persist because that's what we do. The indomitable human spirit finds a way forward. Because tragedy is not what defines us. A story may end in ruin, but life isn't a narrative. Even after heartbreak and disaster, time continues to flow. After their land is ravaged, the people of Thavnir rebuild. After the Empire cannibalizes itself, Garleans provide each other aid. After the world is sundered, life springs back into motion, and eventually, it does what its predecessors couldn't. Time flows ever onward, and even great tragedies begin to fade. The land is scarred, lives are altered and lost. But we still remain, and we move forward. We find a way to continue. Maybe it's love that gives us the strength to do so. Maybe it's the support of those close to us. Maybe it's just spite. There's no such thing as a bad reason to continue. We don't stay in our darkest moments. It takes time, and it takes effort. But as long as we can imagine a future, even so much as a glimmer, we can hold on to hope and find our way through the storm. That necessary movement, that transition, it's the same principle as nihilism. The search for meaning when the world has crumbled around you. So Endwalker is a nihilistic story then. One of true nihilism, not the off-brand misunderstanding that permeates popular culture, yeah? 
Yet, as we've explored, it rejects the classical conclusions of nihilism, going so far as to illustrate its flaws and lack of compassion through Xenos, urging us to instead embrace connection and companionship as absolutely vital parts of life. But that's not the only way it challenges nihilism while maintaining a belief in some of its core principles. As the famous quote goes, God is dead and we have killed him. A statement that you will recall is not literal, but rather an acknowledgement of the myriad ways advancement in our understanding of the natural world has made belief in the divine implausible. Recall how the revelation that the Earth orbits the sun could be the impetus for ideological collapse. Loss of faith is the main route to nihilism, making the philosophy rather solidly atheistic. It's all about finding meaning outside religion and other such constructs, after all. It's easy then to see how this could relate to 14 and Endwalker. Sometimes literally, God is dead and we killed her. Throughout the entire game, we've been a god killer. That's been our job. And on a more metaphorical level, these gods have always been dead. Primals were false idols made to sow the seeds of conflict from the beginning. And yet, Endwalker isn't a staunchly atheistic story. In fact, there's a deeply spiritual undercurrent there. Flow is a major concept in Taoist practice, and many of the concepts permeate the entire story of Endwalker. Flow is practically an arc word in 14, being a spell, a leitmotif that pervades the entire soundtrack, and a description of a literal afterlife, cosmology, and force of nature. Elpis is a garden of Eden full of syrupy sweet apples and knowledge that condemns mankind to its fall. Remembering their faith is what allows countless Thavnarians to hold on to hope and prevent their own transformation into blasphemies. Blasphemies itself is a word that denotes religion. The narrative adamantly refuses to treat faith as a universal failure. The game has yet to go out of its way to debunk the Twelve or the Dusk Mother and the Dawn Father or Gridania's heavily Shinto elementals. It's the faith of the beast tribes that delivers us unto the heavens in the end, even. So even if Endwalker explores, and to some degree agrees with, the front half of nihilism, it still takes every opportunity to turn its conclusions on its head. It refuses to condemn those who find solace in spirituality, taking a fairly agnostic stance wherein false gods are shown for what they are, but true divinity is never out of the question. Not even the ancients could bestow souls, that power was beyond even their pinnacle. The story takes great pains to refute the cynical and self-centered aspects of Nietzsche's answer to nihilism, even as it finds some truth in the theory. And why shouldn't it? The reality is that one would be hard-pressed to find any philosophical structure that perfectly encapsulates and explains reality. Even those heralded as great thinkers were subject to sweeping ideals and cultures of the day that colored their perception of the world. Many philosophers of Eld who had no business in the field of physics put forward their own take on the nature of atoms, and in their attempt to pull wider truths about the world, only managed to look like absolute fools in the modern day. No philosopher is free of bias, and no philosophy is universally correct. What provokes one to look at all philosophers, half suspiciously, half mockingly, is not that one discovers again and again how innocent they are, how often and how easily they make mistakes and go astray, in short, their childishness and childlikeness, but that they are not honest enough in their work. They all pose as if they had discovered and reached their real opinions through the development of a cold, pure, divinely unconcerned dialectic, while at bottom it is an assumption, a hunch, indeed a kind of inspiration, most often a desire of the heart that has been filtered and made abstract that they defend with reasons they have sought after the fact. So where does that leave us? A framework remains, but the conclusion has been rejected. By choosing to abandon philosophical theories, we put ourselves in a bit of a shaky position with no clear-cut path forward. If we can't look to those who claim to have already divined the great meanings of the world for an answer, where can we find guidance? Medion was created for this very purpose, to find meaning in a meaningless world, but her report was of myriad dead worlds, each having striven towards perfection before collapsing under their own weight or being destroyed by outside forces. Their only sin was a desire for happiness, and yet each and every one was cut down, countless lives and worlds snuffed out in what should have been their prime. That torment, that excruciating pain amassed by a little girl alone in the stars with no way to process it. It's no wonder that she wanted to escape, and in her distorted kindness, shield every soul from it by ensuring they'd never be born again. But she too is rejected. Medion's the one we have to defeat and save. The game clearly refutes her stance. So then those worlds and all that despair she hoarded, they can't be right either. 
They all ended in tragedy. Even the Nibiroon, who had everything they could ever dream of. Safety, bounty, beauty, a world free of pain and conflict. And yet, they still longed for the end. They wished for death so fiercely that they created a king among beasts whose singular purpose was to release them from their perfect lives. There's something haunting about it. Doubly so when Word of God is taken into account, confirming that the Ancients would have met the same fate had the final days and its subsequent events not destroyed them. A lack of pain, and yet no happiness, no contentment. Whatever level of pleasure they experienced, it wasn't enough to make them want to live, even in the absence of any sort of conflict. Is this all there is? The best we can hope for. Peace that becomes so comfortable that we grow numb to everything and still, still wish for death. On some level, it seems to posit that we need pain, that sweet in the absence of bitter tastes like nothing at all. That's a bit of a dangerous bid, coming awfully close to fetishizing pain in a way that we already clearly denounced. I do think, however, that there's a bit more of a nuanced point to be found here. Despair is central to Endwalker. It's a constant and vicious companion, and yet it's not what the story is about. There's so much more, so much more in life. The scenes of Ruin and Rue that we see are striking. The image of a Garlean banner splattered with blood or the jungles of Thavnir aflame, they stick with you. But so does the view of a theorist from the moon, or friends gathered around a table, or dawn breaking over the cosmos. How can we put one over the other? As tempting as it would be to flip the script and claim that Endwalker is about defining our lives by joy rather than sorrow, we can't in good faith claim that's the message either. It can't be. Not when the game constantly beseeches us to grapple with life's many sorrows and cruelties. But despite the constant focus, it's important to recognize that Endwalker never posits that suffering is necessary, or rather that it is inevitable. The matter is out of our hands. What we can take from the Nibiru's complacency, then, wraps around to the same thing it always has. Want for meaning and connection. It wasn't endless pleasure that drove their civilization to end itself. Rather, the relinquishment of individuality, and with it, the potential for bonds, or any manner of thought different from the one beside it. That, and the inability to imagine a future, and to find more than a single meaning in life once the first has been attained. Meanings can be lost, sometimes they shatter, and sometimes they're fulfilled. Even when you get exactly what you want, sometimes that can lead to a crisis. By fortune or fickle fate, you'll come to moments in which you're destitute of that one most psychological of needs, without anything to orient you as to who you should be, where you should go, and what you should do. And we're left wanting for truth once more, and so we come back to that eternal question. Why do we live? Where's the answer we were promised? That was always the deal, right? That at the end of everything, we'd find an answer. That we'd finally discover what people live for, what gives their lives meaning, where happiness lies. From answers ringing in a realm reborn to the question Vana poses us under a sky unsundered. From the bold declaration that serves as Heidelin's theme to the song we teach a little girl at the edge of the universe. This was always the pact, one we hoped would be fulfilled. And in the end, I think Endwalker does follow through. We are able to determine an answer. No. But that doesn't mean I'm confused. It simply means I'm the same as everyone else. I'm sure it's no surprise, but this answer isn't something I nor Endwalker can give you. It exists, and it's out there to be found, but, well, I'll let the art speak for itself. What they live for. What gives their lives meaning? There was never a single answer. You gather pieces of happiness, precious and fragile, only to lose them. Then start again. On and on it goes, until death takes you into its gentle embrace. That which Hermes sent us to find was there all this time. On a Theris. It cannot be told, but it certainly exists to be found. That search, that journey to find the color of your own happiness, it's not one anyone else can take for you. We have become fantastic creatures, creatures that have to believe, to know from time to time why we exist. 
It's a tall order, perhaps the greatest challenge we ever face. We might choose to adopt predetermined answers, but to find what really truly matters to us, what lies closest to our hearts and motivates us to greet each day and forge ahead, we have to search. It takes time, and it takes effort. There's no set path, no function to follow that might provide us with a solution. That's both the curse and the blessing of our individuality. These lives we live, each so unique and beautiful. The experiences that built us, the pain and joy that have shaped us, the memories that still guide our hands. Each and every heart kaleidoscopic, laying its own path through life, searching for its own meaning, an amalgamation of every moment, shifting, changing, found, then changed, lost, and found again. Each a different form, a different color, the world a canvas painted in hues innumerable. The anticipation of a half-read story's conclusion. The hope today's mistake may serve as tomorrow's lesson. The wish that a new acquaintance may one day call thee friend. Whatever came before, what matters most is the present. For me, that is being here with my friends. Full proud of how much we've grown together. Of the beauty of light when it shines across a dark and starless sea of a dream that from the soil of worlds now lost to sorrow life will spring forth once more nourished by gentle rains and caressed by uplifting winds lands that stretched on forever skies one could drown in the heartbeat of nature silent yet strong and amidst it all are people, beacons of light and life, laughter that warmed my heart like naught else before. They are my meaning, and my purpose, my love. No answer lies in a true world beyond our own. If we find ourselves unable to pry our eyes from the heavens in a lofty bid at imagined divinity beyond our own, we risk missing the beauty that exists on the ground around us. If we turn away from each other, we deprive ourselves of joy so fundamental that it's baked into our shared genetic code. There is no Eden of pure bliss and love. Utopia was always a fallacy. Even the unsundered world had its thorns. Look no further than Hermes or Erichthonios, and you'll see that Emmet Selk's gilded memories were clouded by a fog of nostalgia and longing. Even so, it's love that put that fog there. There was pain and suffering in that world too, and yet he and so many others found meaning in it. Meaning and joy. None of those distant stars were foolish or wrong for wanting a better world. No one could blame them for trying to eliminate suffering, for wanting to assure joy. But perfection can never be, and if utter, unblemished magnificence is the only happiness you'll accept, well, then you're doomed to fail. Suffering is always going to exist. This much must be accepted. But it's still worthwhile to imagine a brighter future, to take steps to build it and ease the pain of ourselves and the people around us. But no matter what we do, there will still be days when darkness creeps in. What we have to remember is that that doesn't negate joy, nor love, nor anything else we hold dear. We can hold love for the present and hope for the future. And should we lose one, the other will guide us. The flowers at our feet bloom beautifully, be they grown in loving embrace and gentle care, or from cold earth, finding their only nourishment in passing storms. And regardless, flowers die. Their beauty is ephemeral, dazzling and gorgeous, yet destined to fade. This much is undeniable. Everything withers, melancholy as it is. Harsh winds tear petal from stem, and barren winter is unforgiving, allowing not a single bud. But even in death, seeds are sown, and with time, life springs anew. We weather the cold and find ourselves once more in vibrant spring. This moment will fade, yet the memory will linger. Even as the world turns gray, it's possible for our hearts to remain prismatic, for warmth to spread from within, for hope to guide us through the blackest night and onto a morning beyond the horizon. It's hope. It always has been. And Walker can't give us an answer, so it instead bestows upon us a little reminder. A traveler's charm. Just a small blessing that we might remain true and carry on with our eyes open and hearts unclouded. 
More than anything else, Endwalker strives to remind us of what's most important, of that which will light our way through even the darkest night and guide us towards the answers we seek. As goes light, so goes dark. Pain and sorrow are inevitable facets of life, but to dwell only on one of them is folly. We must accept the existence of suffering, but know that it does not define us. We must find a means to continue on, even in our darkest hour. There's always an after. We must remember this and maintain a belief in the future. Hold fast to the hope that dawn will come and joy will return. Even when blinded by shrouds of misery, the world we live in remains beautiful. Whether or not a heaven exists, the scenery we know is still worthwhile product of billions of years of serendipitous miracle. The same miracles that brought about humanity as we know it. All life is connected, our hearts beat as one, and while consumption is a natural part of life, we have to remember that each plant and animal is alive, a breathing being that feels just as we do. Nature is not our toy, and it certainly is not separate from us. Though man has advanced to a state of living often far removed from the wild world, we're still a piece of it, and we depend on nature to live. As we strive to pay credence to our place in the world around us, so too must humanity recognize itself. We came to our current state because of our ability to develop bonds and help each other. We're a species that evolved for cooperation and altruism. The bonds we share with each other are next to the divine, a primordial need and an eternal joy. We're never alone. We can't forget that. And remind others should they lose their way. Compassion is key. To see yourself in the other, to recognize the humanity in every soul, and not allow ourselves to lose sight of it by breaking the other down into basic forms or allegiances. Struggle is inevitable. No one on this planet will live without experiencing stinging loss and burning fear. Life can fall apart, days can grow exceedingly dark. Lend a kind hand where you can, and believe that kindness will find you too. Refuse to surrender to despair. Look to others for support. Imagine a brighter tomorrow. Let love and hope ever guide you, and the future, unknown, perilous, full of possibility, will surely be filled with light as you walk onward forging ahead onto a prismatic morrow. Find your meaning, your purpose. Fill it, lose it, let it change, and accept that the world will ever shift. And with it, you'll discover new meanings, new paths, and people and selves that you never imagined before. Our journey never ends. For all its philosophical ponderings, fantastical tales, and musings on humanity and nature, in the end, what Endwalker offers us is simple. Remember to hold to hope, joy, and love. Basic as it is, this reminder is necessary. This journey is worthwhile. Amidst suffering, we sometimes forget the simplest lessons or lose sight of our most basic values. It's all too easy to become embittered and cynical when buffeted by misfortune's wicked winds. Thus have humans told this story time and again, a story extolling the power of hope, fervent in the belief that light exists even beyond the darkest night. Since the start of our existence, we've called out to each other with the same reminder, sung the same song of hope across every generation, its melody dancing through time, fragile, all too often forgotten, yet ever able to bloom again, to take root and spring forth, brightening the hearts of all those who bear witness. And thus, we find ourselves at dawn, the start of a new day, the promise of a new adventure, perhaps with excitement or trepidation or any other of countless emotions. No matter where or when, we know one thing, we'll forge ahead. To whomever receives this message out there in the vast reaches of the cosmos, I only have a few more borrowed words to leave you. Do you sometimes want to wake up to the singularity we once were? So compact, nobody needed a bed or food, or money. Nobody hiding in the school bathroom. Or home alone. Pulling open the drawer where the pills are kept. For every atom belonging to me, as good, belongs to you. Remember? There was no nature. No them. No tests. To determine if the elephant grieves her calf. Or if the coral reef feels pain. Trashed oceans don't speak English, or Farsi, or French. Would that we could wake up to what we were. When we were ocean. And before that. To when sky was earth. And animal was energy. And rock was liquid, and... Stars were space, and... Space was not... At all. Nothing. Before we came to believe humans were so important. 
before this awful loneliness. Can molecules recall it? What once was? Before anything happened? No I, no we, no one. No was. No verb. No now. Only a tiny, tiny dot brimming with is. 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 All. Everything. Home. Thank you so much for watching this video. It's been a labor of love nearly a year in the making. I care about this story, and I think that's probably pretty clear, but I'm glad I was able to share not just my thoughts with you, but also our world and 14's both. I want to thank everyone who helped me make this happen, from my editor Kyle to all my friends that lent their voice to the project, and everyone that supported me through development, listened to me ramble about Hermes, and gassed me up when I needed it. To the longtime fans of the channel on the DDC Discord that helped me get into this game in the first place and watched some of my early streams, this one goes out to you. If you want to become a longtime supporter of this channel, you can subscribe, like, comment, and even join our Discord. Tell me about your wool. Maybe I'll recognize them one day in roulettes. If you want to help pay my sub, you can support us on Patreon or leave a one-time donation on our Ko-fi. You can also follow us on Twitter at DigiDreamClub, or if you want to see my lizard man specifically for some reason, you can follow me at Moon's Dragoon. Thank you for watching. I hope your journey never ends.